The following takes place from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every weekday on Spice FM. The man who looks at a beautiful girl and doesn't talk to her will end up serving lunch at her wedding. Hi, <laughs> City. Mm. Do like that. My father has killed a mouse. Will he fail to kill a man? I'm a wapanya. Small mammal, big mammal. <laughs> What, what well, are they how saying? are we comparison? I mean, he mouse. What are they saying? What they're saying is, uh, my father has killed a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Will he fail to kill a man? <laughs> <laughs> name, surprise. Someone's name. Surprise. Name I mean, surprised I mean, you? No, the name is surprise. <laughs> no, what am I saying? I'm from Nigeria, man. I met somebody <laughs> called I Believe. So See? Your name is I believe. Yes, my name is I believe. But that's the short form. I said, excuse me. I said yes. My no name problem. is I believe. But what's no, the full name? I believe in the goodness of God. <laughs> <laughs> the Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Good morning, and I love your show. Thank you. <laughs> Having come from a Kikuyu radio background, I migrated to Spice. <laughs> Because of the content. I was born in a slum, but somehow I got a break in life. So sometimes when you see the sweating coming out because of the passion and whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the noise, there are people. And we share the same umbilical cord. It shouldn't be like that. I am so disappointed. We used to tell Honda Boraila Molotinga that he's doing police of conmanship. And even President Uhuru Kenyatta, you cannot promise people that you reduce tax, then you double. In politics, mm. there is uh, the issue of trust. Mm. For you to turn around and then stab the same people who gave you that trust, there is no other level of dishonesty. Good morning and welcome to Tuesday. To Thursday. Yes, this is actually Thursday. I know what it is. Looks like it's a weekend thereafter. Okay, so what's going on here on the roads? We're going to see heightened movement today because we're coming back into um, a work day after a holiday. Yesterday's traffic was not an issue. Um, rather, yesterday traffic was not an issue. We're likely to see a buildup of that today. Um, the heavens have opened. It's raining in most parts of the country today. So we know what happens with that. It slows down traffic. So we'll probably see some spots where it's going to be a thing today. But all to watch and see how that opens up. For now, it looks pretty good. You'll be able to get in and out of the CBD without an issue, whether coming in from the thicker superhighway or coming in from the eastern side on the eastern bypass. The northern bypass looks good as well, as well as the southern bypass. Then getting out of the city, going towards a westerly direction. All right, we're seeing movement right around Haile Selassie already, and inbound traffic is already starting to build up past uh, the roundabout of Haile Selassie. So let's just watch out for that. And Uhuru Highway already looking quite busy right about now as folks are getting out and about. Let's Let's take a look and see what happens as we get through the morning. We'll talk on Spice of MKE on X hashtag the Situation Room. This is the Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, Controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the are Situation Room. The only way you? to start it your day. Mm -hmm. Imagine. I said Tuesday because I was... No, I actually said... What did I say? Welcome to Tuesday. Yesterday was Monday. <laughs> Today is Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that Monday. Mm, you know those Mondays that are Tuesdays? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yesterday was all that. I don't know. Man. I don't even know, man, yeah. what it was. It was just like... Sticking These weeks, man. <laughs> Sijui, the, the Easter one had a short. <sighs> These weeks are kind of confusing. Hmm. But yeah, even you could not end up. We here. Mm. Hmm. Even you could not end up. Otherwise. 
otherwise mm. well it's raining it was hot last night uh -huh. heavens opened and it has cooled down mm -hmm. yeah yesha, my friend Inanyesha, huh? mm. inamuagika kumuagika. Mm. Where? It rained overnight. Did it rain during the day where you are? During the day, no. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, even where I was, it didn't rain during the day. Haiku nyesha muchana. Imanyesha usiku. Yeah. Um, everybody, how are you doing? Thank you very much for those who are locked in on Spice FM, those who are joining our live streams on uh, YouTube, Facebook, um, uh, and, and, and the Radio Garden and the other online platforms. Let me tell you what we shall be discussing today. Uh, so first, we're seeing all these issues about road safety, mm -hmm. the accidents, mm -hmm. this and the other. Mm -hmm. um, public service vehicles involved a lot in this. The CEO of the Matatu Owners Association is called Patricia Muleo. She will be joining us at uh, 7 a.m. to talk about road safety and accident prevention. Are we doing enough? What more should be done on this particular front? Of course, uh, public service vehicles, Matatus, have been blamed for this. Mm. Um, then we also come on to heavy commercial vehicles and individual motorists. So we'll ask her, okay, what are we doing and what should we do? At 8 o'clock... We have invited Titus Lotte. He is the MP for Kachaliba constituency in West Pokot County. He is also a member of uh, what committee of parliament? He said what? Wait. I'm waiting. Good grief. He meant it. <laughs> it has left me. <laughs> okay. So he'll come and we'll talk about corruption in the country and what parliamentarians are doing in uh, their oversight role mm. to fight corruption it's raining it means floods floods means displacement of people and a uh, lot of suffering mm. and then uh, in some areas it's raining it's flooding and there are bandits yeah mm. when it rains it pours literally yes did you see the video of um, this place uh, uh, area between um, Moingi and Garissa, it flooded over the, I think it was a Sunday, Sunday. And the folks sit at the top of bus? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. The bus was stranded for six hours oh, inside the raging waters and people are just sitting up, up there like, okay. How? Imagine. You can't swim. Even if you could swim, you know what they say, mm. raging waters like that, even if you're a very good swimmer, it'll take it'll you. It'll take you. It's so crazy. You wait. It's crazy. Now, the Kenya Red Cross is involved in all these disasters across the country, mm. right? In trying, just trying to help people. So, the Secretary General of the Kenya Red Cross, Dr. Idris Ahmed, joins us at 9 a.m. to talk about all these things and what the Red Cross is doing across the country. Mm. And also just advise people, okay, so because they have the experience, what should we do when we see some things? Also, they have been involved in fires, they've been involved in uh, the Embakasi fire. In road accidents as well they are also involved with their ambulance services okay so let's talk about kenya red cross at nine it's 13 minutes after six if you're online and we can see many of you are let us know how you're doing how was it for you uh where are you is it day or night or afternoon or morning whatever let us know we'll be shouting you out shortly after the weather forecasts Cloudy conditions in Nairobi, rainy conditions actually this morning. We'll see highs of 26 and lows of 16. Cloudy at 16 in Nakuru with some rain as well, highs of 27. And we'll see highs of 26 in a rainy Nyeri at 15. It's 15 and cloudy in Eldoret. Rain's coming in later with highs of 25. We'll see lows of 14. Uh, it's clear in Mombasa for now at 27 with highs of 33. And Malindi at 28 is cloudy with highs of 33 and lows of 27. Kisumu's cloudy at 20 with highs of 29. And we'll see highs of 29 in a mostly cloudy Kakamega currently at 17 and it's cloudy in Kampala at 20 highs of 29 and 32 will be the high in a mostly cloudy Dar es Salaam at 26. It's 10 degrees and mostly clear in Johannesburg with highs of 20 and we're looking into uh, will be sunny Mogadishu at 27 with highs of 33 Addis Ababa at 
12 is mostly clear with highs of 25 and Lagos is mostly cloudy at 29 with highs of 33. We'll see highs of 34 in a mostly clear Kinshasa at 26. And we're looking into a sunny Beijing Thursday afternoon with highs of 23 and lows of 11. It's cloudy at Paris at 11. We'll go to highs of 18 while London will see highs of 18. Currently cloudy at 13. Wednesday night is flooding in New York. It's 11 degrees. Coming into Thursday, we'll see highs of 18 and lows of 10. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM. Good morning to you. Jumbo Roberts. says Meshak Jenga. Ndu Eric. Which yes. I'm assuming is what he meant to say by putting an L where the R is. <laughs> CT and Edna, Canada says Jumbo. <laughs> Ihmad Rashid Isak says good morning. Sorry, Ibrahim Rashid Isak says good morning. Mm. Tano is tuning from Rochester in, Ma in Minnesota. Mm. Greetings from Ken Kibara mm. from Kabatini in Nakuru. Keep up the great service, Kenyans. Asante Sana. Moses Nyambura says good morning. Great people of our country tuned in from Imaradaima. Our feeder roads and drainage systems are messy here. Yes, Oi. they are. Passed there this morning and it's crazy. It's, I don't even know. Oi. By the rivers of Imara Daima. Uh -huh. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Because it's madness. Mm -hmm. Uh, one mic says, good morning, Situation Room from Baltimore, Maryland. Happy Friday, Eve, y'all. Shout out to you three. Mm -hmm. oh. Um, good morning, lovely people. Jimmy Wekasa also says good morning. Mm. Stella S is saying good morning. Isaac Cheruti says good morning. Ndu, it's Thursday. Yeah, man. I was just confused. The day did that thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we are here Thursday morning. Mashari Jeru says good morning, team. Good morning to you. Brian Otieno says good morning. The most emergency cases reported during Ramadan was overeating. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Venvik is tuned in from Mombasa and says to go holiday. Oh, really? How come? Grace is tuned in from Tamu. Brian Oteno says, Uku Dubai, normal working hours resume on the 15th of April. Ah, right. So there's an extended uh -huh. holiday due to Eid. Uh -huh. Understood. Um, 15th on is when? Saturday. 15th is Monday. So they have the entire name, Paka Monday. Yeah. Hello. It continues. Even Nigeria, I think the Eid... Um, it's until Friday. Wow. Onganyi mm. Malala mm -hmm. says, good morning. Eric Ndu, Edna Yego. Some of us are here, some of us are not. Yeah. Brian Otieno says, um, what happened to the monies that was pledged to tackle El Nino? That's a good question. Let's keep asking. Good morning. Greetings, my good people. Samuel Bakora is tuned in this morning, says, have a prosperous day. And you say that it's very cold in Embu. Mm. Okay. Jennifer Tenyi says, good morning, Spice team. Georgia Koth is greeting everybody and says, how can we reawaken this government to know that the people who voted for them are dying mm. because of the doctor's strike? Well, hmm, if we're alive, if we're not alive to death, mm. there is a problem. Ricardo Marietta says, good morning from Kitengela. Uh, good morning, everybody, says, bald heads. Okay. Hello, Spices. I'm truly tired listening to these crazy corrupt politicians. We now rather invite choirs to the hot seat to come and sing. <laughs> like the people on the Titanic who just kept singing while the thing was sinking. <laughs> okay. Joseph Kimonge says, good morning, tuned in from Ibencho in Kisi. Samson is tuned in from University of, Mo or rather, Moy University. Paul Eric says, I like this morning. Okay, thanks to the situation. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Aaron Kimathi is tuned in from Japan. Just Japan. Okay. Good to have you guys this morning. Thanks for joining us bright and early. Let's go. Kariboni son a kilomutu. Oh, it's a proverb time. Mm. Hiya, I'd forgotten. Why? Hey. Hiya. Uh, proverb from Morocco, mm -hmm. the kingdom. If you have to beg, beg the rich people. <laughs> As opposed to the <laughs> poor people. <laughs> if you have to beg. Beg the rich beg people. Beg the rich people. Maybe they'll give you. Yes. Okay. I see. What do you see? Go where there's potential. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, why are you wasting time? Your time, their time, when you know yeah, they don't you know have. They know you know they don't have. Yeah. So... Go where there is potential. Mm -hmm. mm. If you have to beg, 
the Bug the rich people. people. Okay. The headline? Kagwe. Uhuruto lie haunting the president. You wonder which Kagwe? Mm -hmm. In 2017, an election year, then President Uru Kenyatta and his deputy William Ruto had to placate medics who were on 100 day strikes and entered into a CBA, which former cabinet secretary Mutahi Kagwe now says is hard to implement. Mm. So, why did you do it then if you knew? Mm. Ah, President Ruto has disowned the deal, leading to prolonged suffering. <laughs> Kill. All right, so. Uh -huh. um, other headlines for Ryla. It is a case of damned if he did and damned if he didn't. Okay, if he, if he, because the talk is around, okay, is he going to stay and work as opposition and then start to um, agitate for the needs of Kenyans? Uh -huh. Or is he going to take the seat at the AUC should it then be um, offered to him? Either way. This loss and gain yes. is what this story is saying. Well, yeah. let's have a look at that later. Mm. Why Wetangula is a man under siege at home. He's a man under siege. Okay. Yeah. And he's a man under siege at home, no less. So, uh, where? Which home? Home Western. Oh. Bungoma. Not house. Not house Not home. Not house home. Home uh, home. Uh, Doping lies and... are safe. That's it? Sorry. No, go on. <laughs> Doping mm. lies and selling a country's honor for a few cents. Mm. In 2019, some overzealous journalists working for a Danish television channel mm. sought out retired athlete Elias Kiptum for a special favor to fix his elite colleagues for doping. Mm -hmm. Where were we? We're looking to that story because it's coming to a head <laughs> right about now. Yeah, so those are some of the headlines. Yeah, and those are beautiful pictures from celebrating Id in style. It's a really nice picture. Very cute children there. And for faithful hold prayers at Kisi Jamia Mosque yesterday. Ooh. Yeah, it was, a, it was well celebrated, Id, mm. around the world. And the celebrations continue in other countries mm. beyond, to, to, uh, beyond yesterday. Yeah. Mm. Very, very good. Start with that. Uh, which story do you want to start with? Kagwe is talking. Let's okay. see. Because they're basically coming out to say, yeah, well, we signed something. And even then we knew that mm -hmm. it was going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. Talk less of now. Uh, it's still likely to irritate quite a number of people. But let's look at the details of what the story says. You can do that. And then I'll give you the screenshots. of. I might just give you the other headlines. Okay, give the other headlines. Okay. The Daily Nation this morning says how counties did what? Fixed big money tenders. Where? <laughs> Scandal, it says. Audit report for the year ended June 30th last year reveals how rules are routinely bent by county officials to hand lucrative contracts to preferred merchants, leaving taxpayers to incur heavy losses in inflated prices and huge payments for shoddy or no work done at all. Yeah? Okay. Hiya. Call of strike or face the music, doctors told. Striking doctors have been given 24 hours to call off their strike or face disciplinary action. Head of public service Felix Koske has urged them, had, has urged them to return to the negotiations table in compliance with a court order. Okay. Um, the other headline here is uh, I'm Azimio's best bets. Firebrand NAC Kenya Party leader Martha Karua, who was Azimio's leader Raila Odinga's running mate in the 2022 general election, insists she has the metal to take over the coalition's leadership and dismisses why Pascalonzo Musioka as lacking the authority to steer the opposition. Karua Amesema Kalonzo Hatoshi. Bunga Tower MPs to move into new swanky offices. Members of parliament are expected to occupy their new office building, which took over eight years to be completed. They're moving in today. Okay. Let's wait until they move then before we start Let's even saying anything. Let's see them sitting inside the oh, office before yes. we say anything. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the Business Daily. Banks face 500 billion shilling hit on state's single account shifts. Hey, <laughs> kid too. Commercial banks now want the Treasury to appoint them as collecting agents for its centralized account as they look to soften the blow of losing hundreds of billions of shillings in stable deposits from state agencies. When the new system is rolled out, banks through their lobby, the Kenya Bankers Association, say that they have started discussions with the Treasury and the Central Bank of Kenya to ensure the implementation of the Treasury single account and choices of model will not disrupt their operations 
and those of the affected state agencies. Okay. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> remember, state agencies are holding like a gazillion accounts yeah. in the various commercial with banks. Gazillion shillings. Yes, with gazillion shillings. Mm. The cabinet has approved. Let's go into a treasury single account. One account for everything. Now, now banks are saying, si basi, basi, si tukue collector agent, Pesa in a kuja, a laugh, then we, we now put the money now into the into your, your, your. So the, 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 the state agency can still maintain a ka, sort of a can account. Yeah, just a, 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 a check of kama tu ile a salary. Pesa in a ingia, unato na end of a lipa rent. Mm. Right? Just holding for a short time. Yeah, yes, just facilitate. Yeah, you. just to facilitate. You know, it cannot be easy. <laughs> I don't want to put that pressure on you. <laughs> <laughs> Other headline why pump prices will go up. From next month guy Where? the prices of merb and crude on the global market have climbed to highs last seen in october last year setting up kenyans for a rise in the cost of fuel after a short season of decline that started in december well, le, le, le. <laughs> ticker headlines a uh, 11.6 billion arrears rock teachers police medical scheme sorry you remember medical scheme see they said the it. police yeah uh, remember they moved away from you know NHIF blah 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 blah. Yes, they created their a own. private one. Yes. yes, teachers, police, and prison officers have been dealt a blow over an outstanding medical insurance debt of over 11 billion shillings, forcing them to pay cash to access medical services. What happened to the pro collection of premiums? Who knows, man? I do not know, man. Because people, by virtue of them being employees, there's a certain amount that is removed from your salary I, I, on a monthly I, basis, I, which I, supposedly I, goes to this health abbey. Me, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Me, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Lord. Nine months domestic debt grows to 424 billion shillings. The government has borrowed 424 billion shillings from the domestic market in the last nine months. 400 billion shillings. Okay. A lot of that is Kenyans lending the government. And you know the interest rates? Mm. Over 16%. Yeah. The rate of state borrowing from the local market accelerated during the first nine months ended March with fresh debt hitting 424.7 billion compared to 274 billion of new borrowing in the same period a year earlier. <laughs> 20% of Kenyan CEOs cut jobs on sales drop. About a fifth of CEOs of private sector companies reduced jobs in the three months ended March. Okay. CBK tips the economy to grow 5.7%. This Our economy is growing 5.7% this year. The central bank is looking at projections and thinking the way we are seeing the various sectors behaving. 5.7% growth. So, <laughs> there's a minute called the People Daily. Okay. Uh, it has a headline here, a small headline on page two. Call me to scribes, don't call me at night. The police boss downplays bribery of officers on highways. Don't call me at night. At, yeah, some journalists are calling, call me. Where? IG, IG. Police were right here. Ah, come on. <laughs> I'm sleeping. Uh, the other headline, state starts crackdown on schools holding certificates over fees. Education Ministry is mulling installation of technology to ensure candidates directly access their results. Uh, this story was, uh, this order was being discussed in Parliament the other day. We read it yesterday in the story. Big headline in the People Daily today, Kenyans making illegal payments. To who? I don't know. Okay. Senator Kavindu of Machakos County is the one who's been quoted here. I As representatives of the people, we should not allow people to pay levies or taxes where there is no law. Ah. That's it. Illegal mm. Okay, so. mm. okay. That's it. Okay. Uh, do you want me to tell you about the Taifa Leo before I tell you about the star? Mm. Taifa Leo headline moja hapa inasema County Thalathini za mulikuwa kwa ukabila. Zimekosa kutimiza usawa katika kuwajiri wafanyakazi wake. 30 counties have been fingered for tribalism. Is it? They have not hit the threshold of uh, the balance of employees in their county. What is the balance, I wonder? Eh? 
What's the balance? So there's a, there's a balance. In a county, at least 30% of your staff should be from outside your county. Ah, okay. So 70% you're allowed to do indigenous. Yes. But also in that 70% distribute, if you're a multi-indigenous multi <laughs> tribe mm. county, mm. distribute them. Okay. Yeah. You cannot be Migori and all of you are Luos, and mm. then you do not have Korea. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Okay. Higher. Mbunge wa West Mugirango aomba ruto msamaha kwa niaba ya kemosi. Alaumiwa kwa kukataa kuwa balozi. Remember there's a guy who had been appointed as an ambassador. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, ah, due to personal reasons, I'm afraid I, 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 can't, take this I up. can't take this up. Mm. Now there's an MP who's saying, please, Mr. President, please forgive, forgive our guy. Forgive our guy. Just give us another guy. Yeah. Mm. You don't worry. Just give us another guy. We are good for it. Yes. Yeah, okay. Eh, mjane apoteza wanawe wawili katika ajali. A widow loses two children in an accident. <sighs> Familia na kuru ya umboleza vifo vya kifungua na kitinda mimba walio kufa ajalini. It was the first and last born who died oh, in a road accident in Nakuru. <laughs> eh, kisi kukutanya ushuru katika mju wa keroka. Agizo jipia linafutilia mbali wa muzi wa mahakama ya arthi hadi rufa itakapo sikizwa na kuamuliwa. There's been a dispute here about Keroka, Keroka town. Mm -hmm. Keroka is like a town before you get to Kisi. Mm -hmm. Now Keroka, there's a boundary area there between Nyamira County mm -hmm. and Kisi Ka Count. Count. Uh, there's a line of shops that is now considered as the boundary. Between Yamira and Kisi? Yes. Okay. In the same town. Mm -hmm. So, county A collects revenue from this side of town. <laughs> county B collects revenue from this side of town. Mm. Kisi has been accused by Yamira of collecting the needs from the bigger side of town, which is not theirs. It's not. The court had said, yes, 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 yes. This one, Yamira should. The yes. environment and land court. Mm. But now, um, a matter has been frozen and told Kisi, you can collect until we resolve this matter. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Because they've measured and seen actually you guys. That's you. I don't know. <laughs> the big headline is Mata Karua's interview Kenya in Aendambrama. I think people just make up words and say it's Kiswahili. Kenya in Aendambrama. Mrama. Mm. Okay. Kenya is going like this. <laughs> <laughs> Kenya is exiting stage left. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Mrama is. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Aya, the star. Pay queries as MOH directs hiring of 8,571 UHC workers. The Ministry of Health has recommended the hiring on permanent and pensionable terms of the 8,000 plus health workers contracted under the UHC, raising concerns on who will pay their salaries. Remember we asked that question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, weather forecast. Flood warning. Met predicts heavy rainfall around the Lake Victoria Basin. You know what that means. Those rivers, plains, overflow, problems. plains, quisha, things go out. Top right hand corner in teal green. Well done. New bill wants long serving union federation officials removed. Ha 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 ha. Sorry. <laughs> they have the photo here of Francis at all. Okay. <laughs> Start there. <laughs> That's what the bill is basically saying. <laughs> People who have been le in leadership of unions and federations for a very long time Decades. should now have a term limit. Okay. Mm. Well, that's going to be fun if that goes beyond Let just us the headline. See. Yeah. Bang in the middle of the paper is mm -hmm. the photo of Muslims marking end of Ramadan with Eid prayers. And the caption here is Muslims perform prayers on Tonoka grounds in Mombasa yesterday. And then the headline is not on Eid Manenos. It is ANC now wants Ford Kenya and UDA to fold in Maja. Yeah, she's so going to be a super power. ANC is Musalia's party. Already. He says we should all now become one party. UDA, UDA also. No, even UDA to fold. To fold and become one party. Mm. I wonder what it will be called. Yeah, we call it super whatever. <laughs> super power. And fooder. <laughs> Something like that. Wait and see. Right? Uh, where Ta Party rubbishes the push, ah. wants to strengthen ahead of the 2027 election. Oh, God. Yeah, for Kenya, we say, Tawe. Maja, Tawe.
<laughs> it can never be us. Not us. Not yourselves. No, to make a <laughs> no way. <laughs> 25 minutes to 7 tell us about traffic and then you'll tell us about the Mutahika go on senior mm. hiya Okay, what does Thursday morning look like? Um, are we seeing any traffic that has built up so far? It was busy on Haile Selassie from very early morning, still is up until now. And if we take a look at what's coming off the Thika Superhighway, you know, minimal traffic. Did folks think that today was a holiday as well? It's not. Go to work. Uh, but in the meantime, before you do, just so you know that there's no traffic, right? Um, coming off of Waiaki, it also looks pretty good and we're looking at the... Um, many parts of Chiroma as you come out of Westlands heading towards the city that also is all right okay um, the thicker superhighway right around that Pangani underpass is where we'll see some traffic um, it's normal it's not too bad Kiambu Road nothing happening as you swing round towards Muthaiga Square that's where you have some traffic as you're trying to get into the city centre apart from that it all looks good let's talk on Spice FM KE on X hashtag the situation room Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice Athletics 2017 CBA Uhu Ruto drafted returns to haunt Ruto government. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the collective bargaining agreements that health workers signed in 2017 uh, central to the doctor's strike was influenced by political promises during an election period and will be impossible to implement. This is according to former health cabinet secretary Mutahi Kagwe. Mm. So he's basically said, without me even reading anything else, mm. that yeah, 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 we signed a CBA, but you know, we wanted to do it. We did it basically because, you know, we needed some, to score some political points. We've, we saw that it would take us far in terms of mileage and it would give us leverage to say that we're interested in doing this. But in terms of its implementation moving forward, Gumu. Gumu, it's as dead as a dodo, dead in the water, Boy. still born, not happening. Yeah, we we'll read the story now. Now, yeah. <laughs> he was not held CS when the CBA was signed, mm. faced the implications of this agreement when he took over the ministry just before COVID-19 outbreak in Kenya. <laughs> in fact, he became CS on Monday. The first case of COVID was found on a Friday. Mm -hmm. He spent much of his time negotiating with health workers to prevent industrial action. He spoke yesterday and he admitted that election periods are often filled with promises from candidates seeking power, but the reality hits after they take office. This is very interesting that he says this now. At that time, President Uhuru Kenyatta and his Deputy President William Ruto, now the President, promised to look into doctors' welfare. It was during elections when the doctors demanded the CBA, but promising is different from implementing. Even doctors are usually promised things that those who promise know too well that the promises cannot be achieved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he admitted the former president Uhuru Kenyatta's administration intended to implement the CBA but faced hurdles after forming the government. Kagwe observed that the ongoing doctor strike will only be resolved if the government and the doctors um, union engage to engage in dialogue and called on both parties to stop grandstanding. He went on to talk about, you know, basically giving a word to each of them and saying, please come and have a discussion. <laughs> the contentious CBA, which President William Ruto has disowned by stating that the government would not meet its demands, was crafted after the longest health worker strike in Kenya's history. The strike lasted for 100 days when Ruto was the deputy president. Doctors stayed away from work for three months and 10 days, while nurses were on strike for 150 days. Mm -hmm. The document was crafted by a seven-member committee that comprised four representatives from the Ministry of Health, and three from the Kenya Medical Pharmacists and Dentists Union. The purpose was to regulate relations between the two parties and of interest of promoting the economic well-being of health workers and improving service delivery in public hospitals. The crux of this matter, which irks me to my bone, yeah. is that, again, this thing, it was not even worth the ink that was used to sign it in terms of value mm. that those who signed the cba mm. 
in 2017 mm. that then was supposed to last for the next four years mm. knew very well that they were not going to implement it mm. so you know what happens as a result of that mm. that in 2024 when we're mm. now clamoring and making all of this noise it's just an extension of the failed promise that yes we signed it but you know what we needed to have some kind of political leverage and we know very well that things that you promise are often difficult to implement when you get into the position Remember, I'm asking Patterson Washira, Peterson Washira yesterday of the Clinical Officers Union. Mm. This is what happens <laughs> with the CBAs. Teachers sign CBAs, they will complain about implementation. Doctors sign CBAs, they'll complain about its implementation of the CBAs. You, you see the kind of things that are put in the CBAs and you're like, okay. Yeah, yeah, it sounds ideal mm. if you could actually implement this thing, but can you implement this thing? Can you implement it? And this is what we see. If you look at the number of issues that were in uh, the, the, the CBO of 2017, including the pay, the terms of service, mm. the medical, comprehensive, the nini, 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 nini. I mean, it's a very beautiful suit of training, internship, yeah. facilities, urban rights, union rights, employee classification, placement and promotion, transfer policy, committee meetings. Committee meetings. That they said that with regularity they would mm. be meeting and sorting out some of these things. Mm. How many? No. Sorry, I interrupted you. Please continue. Because my head is <sighs> aching. I'm not surprised. What Mutai Kago is saying is what's been there. I mean, we've seen it. I, I, I just gave you the example of teachers. As far back as I can remember. Yeah. Teachers would strike. The union leaders would have a meeting. They'd be like, okay, so from this thing, what can we implement? Can we implement this, 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 and the other? They sign a deal. They have a return to work agreement. They go back to work. Part of it is implemented partially. <clears throat> okay? Mm -hmm. And then others don't get implemented. Coming to a new CBA, another conversation then happens. It's the same thing. It's doctors, same thing. You have a CBA. You've signed it. This thing to implement it is ngumu. It's the same thing we talk about our constitution. So, yeah, it has ideals but are some of those things to be implemented in one year in two years in three years in four years can we just be real and realistic but the thing for me eric and i think it goes a little bit deeper than this is that mm. the intention your intention mm. forget about what's on paper and what is signed mm. that you who is sitting in a position of influence or in a position of power authority mm. you know full well that as you're coming into this thing that you don't have the intent to actually get it done you may have the intent you but know you that know you, you, you will do it be, partially you but you're just gonna say yeah, yeah well right now my <coughs> agenda is mm. to get folks off the streets yeah my agenda is to put them back into the hospitals or whatever yeah what happens after that i really don't care i mean i really it's not my focus right now i'm trying to diffuse this pressure situation yep Whatever you need me to sign, I'll sign. Mm -hmm. Whatever you need me to implement in the short term, three to six months, we will do. Yep. Thereafter. We shall now kick we shall that now can. Kick it, kick it, kick it, kick it down yep. the road. And I think it's that attitude is with those in government who are signing. They're like, mm -hmm. this thing, we cannot 100% implement this thing. There's some things that we can implement, and there's some things that can be negotiated later. The union leaders who are signing it also know that it cannot be implemented. And they know they that know. these guys, they, are, they, they know. But they know that once we ink it on paper, it forms the basis for the next negotiation. That we can use it then for leverage yes. later. Because you signed. We can use it for the next negotiation. If we have said that the pay shall go up, up by 30%, there's no time we shall come and negotiate the pay of 20%. It shall start from that. We had agreed last time 30%. You have not implemented that. In fact, now this time we want 60 Okay. <laughs> everybody knows it's it's the art of negotiation here and the level of honesty on both sides is wanting is what is uh, that's for sure mm. because now i think it's very clear that both because you think about it right if you look at listen to the problem mm. uh, to, for today if you go if you if you're going to beg what's it beg from a rich person yep by the time you're going to make a request you know the potential or the capacity of you the know. person that you're asking or yeah. you know from past experience with the 
three home authors government, you know mm. that we can. This is what can happen. Mm. So you ask yourself, why beyond what you've just talked about? Mm. Why beyond a tool for leverage? Mm. Would you go into something like this? You, it's just that that you know they can't. You know they won't. But it's something for us to continue to push. We push a little bit more. We push a little bit more. Now, for me, I think that's dangerous. You mm. know why? Because there are folks within both uh, sides yep. who truly, honestly, call them naive or whatever you want to call them. But they truly, honestly believe mm. that this thing is going to come to, to reality. Mm. That's why we had the pushback. I remember on uh, just a couple of days ago, um, Dr. Luga was fighting fires on socials mm. because they said, you guys, you go and negotiate things that you know very well are impossible to implement. Mm. And then you come and drag the rest of us and tell us to go to the streets. So some doctors in some quarters were saying, you know, it's really not fair. Don't go to those tables and represent us when you know that these things cannot be implemented. Yeah. And you know you're dealing with a government who also is not going to implement these things. And then you leave us you leave us here in the trenches mm. so is there a game afoot it's it comes up to the, con the conversation about honesty at, in, at all stages this one is not going anywhere because none of us wants to be honest huh? yeah none of us wants to be honest we have tried this thing of uh, we don't have money uh, you, you, you have money you're buying you money this thing. Mm. back and forth back and forth so okay so let's sign this thing but at the back of our minds ahead we know this thing is progressive but ideally by the end of that cba you should be having a conversation and saying so we have implemented 40 percent of cba 60 percent of cba 70 percent of cba these are the challenges can we now address the challenges going forward that's if where the meetings honest. that's where that's where the meetings come in mm. can we address these challenges going forward how do we reach this but those who sign and those who implement different people totally and that's why you see cleopa mailu and uh, peter munya cleopa as minister and peter munya as chairman of the council of governors them they want this thing off so they can go and hit election trail guy comes in called mutai kago he's told implement this cba he's like oh my god in the middle of these things how mm. do we how do we how do we die mutai kago goes now it's nakumicha pressure nakumicha you should resign you cannot even like, you push pressure 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 they'll go to the table they'll agree to some things <sighs> here and there like now that whole issue of can you absorb this uhc doctors Okay, let's absorb the USC doctors. Okay, so uh, what are the modalities? Who's paying? Is it a, a Ministry of Health budget? Is it a county budget? If it's Ministry of Health, is Ministry of Health? Are we maintaining it this way? What's happening? What had the summit of the President and the Council of Governors agreed on this USC doctors? Are we transferring the, 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 the wage bill to counties? What? Those ones we shall deal with. Eh? Where Sasa Kwanza, let's talk about we are hiring these USC doctors. So. So we're going to see a repetition of that. Yes. We will see it yes. in, the in the coming days because you know what? The pressure thing, the balloon will become very tight mm. and somebody is going to have to, you know, both sides are going to have to let down guard at some mm. point. Mm. And we will see again another agreement has been reached. But mm. what is it? It's leverage for the next level. Yep. That's what it is. That's what we're going to see. All this noise will be making, 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 making noise. Yep. You may see that... Um, in the upcoming supplementary budget, there'll be some increased money for intern doctors. Mm. Okay? But then, keep a keen eye on the budget itself in June. How much money is going to be allocated for intern doctors? Mm. You may see a drop in it. And then we'll have another cycle of issues again coming. How do you move forward when you keep going in circles? It's oscillating. Yes. It's just doing this. Mm. We'll have issues again. National okay. Treasury will come to Parliament and say, you see, we are cutting back our budget by 500 billion shillings, so we cannot uh, continue have paying interns. Do you have much amount of money? So, we saw, nee, 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 nee. so in the next year, interns, there'll be no money <laughs> to send them. And then we'll be back here. There's a story in the news recently. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I think this was Tuesday. Yes, it was on Tuesday where a retired athlete and a coach were sentenced for fabricating documents with a view of tarnishing Kenya's image mm. as a doping haven. 
This athlete is called Elias Kiptu Maindi. He was jailed for one and a half years while the coach Paul Kibet Simbole was sentenced to one year in prison. Mm. Kiptum and Kibet were found guilty of giving false information about the country's top athletes and sharing the same with foreign media. This was according to JKA magistrate Jerry Thuku, who found the director of public prosecution, Renson Ngonga, had proved that the two had forged documents that uh, were claiming doping was being promoted and encouraged by several state agencies in the country. Now, that is a, a news report. Kamau Mudoni of uh, The Standard has actually now done a story looking at the genesis of this whole maneno. Mm. Apparently, in 2019, some overzealous journalists working for a Danish TV ch channel reached out to retired athlete Elias Kiptum. Mm. The reporter engaged the athlete on Kenya's supremacy in athletics, and in between the conversation, which was mostly on social media, he sought a special favor. This favor was to have Kiptum, the athlete, fix his elite colleagues for doping. It was the favor. At the time, the likes of Vivian Cheruyot, Amos Kipruto, and Helen Obiri were running the breath out of other elite athletes and bringing Kenya the coveted honors in track and field sports. This Danish TV channel is called Documenta Kompangdignet. Forget about it. It's a Danish <laughs> TV channel. Thank you. They dangled to keep tune some niceties. One, a written contract that the TV channel would make sure to help him, his wife, and children would be abroad when the documentary was air would air all he needed to do was to be part of a toxic narrative that he knew about doping and the running environment in kenya the reporter is the one who would be seen on the camera and even the the athlete would be seen mm. from the tv channel side anna theory stein odberg hansen signed the contract on february 20th 2020 Kiptum signed it a day later, February 21st. Kiptum roped in his athletics coach, Paul Kibet, into the deal five months later. Kibet signed a deal on July 22nd, and his wife, Zedi Geruto, also signed an agreement. The t TV reps signed the document, while Judy Jepkoske and Elias signed as witnesses. Kibet was required to narrate in the documentary that he knows about running environment in Kenya, and inside the anti-doping agency and athletics in Kenya. He was also promised a trip abroad, and all he had to do was to secretly do recordings and hand them to the TV channel for using the documentary that was to run from May 2021. Just as Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, Kiptum, the TV channel, and Kibet were ready to have the entire country on the international cross for a trip abroad and as little as 5,000 Kenya shillings. What? Court documents seen by the standard indicate that the athlete and the coach sold their souls to the TV channel for money with the highest amount that Kibet, the coach, got from this TV channel being 119,000 shillings. The money from the TV channel was being sent through its sister company, PUST IVS. An analysis of Kibet Kiptum's Oppo phone indicated that he had chatted with Stein Denmark and had 15 letters alleged to be from the anti-doping agency of Kenya. The first letter was for June 2017, which concerned Eunice Jepkoech. Another one dated February 3rd, 2020, was about Gianni de Madonna. There was another letter allegedly addressed to Athletics Kenya in May 2019 about Helen Obiri. Another separate one to British Chepkoech dated uh, September 5th, 2019, and to Vivian Cheruyot dated May 15th, 2017. All these letters apparently were fake because in the court, the officials of the Anti Doping Authority of Kenya, Agency of Kenya, including the CEO, went there and said, We do not write such kind of letters. Mm. How the procedure that we use, according to even the World Anti Doping Agency, is we write a notice to the athlete yeah saying this is it this is what we found and this is therefore communicating to you that you've been suspended we don't just write mm. you see these letters were just for, for letters were just saying you've written blah 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 because in truth helen obiri has not been suspended no she's not so the, it can be we are suspending you okay another one dr moni wekesa is a board member of adak mm. in some letter it is alleged that he assigned a ceo 
So he goes there and says, surely, hata kama ni kufeji, ni kufoji kitu. It is common knowledge I am not the CEO mm. of ADAC. Why would you even bring a letter exactly. claiming that I'm the CEO the one, of ADAC? And then there's a signature. Obviously, it's yes. not me. It's not me. The documentary went, it aired. Okay. <laughs> uh, in reply, Kiptum, the athlete, said he was arrested on April 21st, 2021. I mean, in April 2021 in Elrod. He denied that the Oppo phone was his. He also claimed that there was no proof that Jedi is his wife. He further argued that there was no evidence to show he got money from the TV channel or he had a contract with Anna Ostein. Kiptum, the coach, told the court, oh no, the, the athlete told the court that he did not interact with Kibet, the coach, and did not know that he had received money from the television channel. Kibet, the coach, on the other hand, said he was a coach and an athlete. He claimed there was nothing to show that he had intended to destroy Kenya's reputation. He, however, admitted receiving money from the TV station. His narrative was that Kiptum knew Anna and Stein and that he communicated with them because the journalists wanted to know their story about growing up as athletes. The father of two said he cut links with the Danish TV channel when they started investigating doping. Kibet threw Kiptum under the bus after he said that the athlete was very well paid by the journalists. Magistrate Jerry found that the charts the bank statements, the recordings by the two were clear that the two were out to destroy the country's athletics. And why? The magistrate said, mm. I find the defense presented by Elias and Paul respectively are both a sham. Mm. I dismiss their defense. It does not dislodge the weight of the prosecution evidence presented. I'm interested in what happened to this station. What happened? When they reached out to the station, uh, the station said we are independent. We do not disclose this, our sources. But you are criminals. We do not disclose our sources. You are criminals because it was. Are we clear, criminals? It was clear that what you were trying to do was to besmirch the names no, we of not. certain individuals. We just got who, sources who told us. Who, and the they sources gave us, were wrong, but you went ahead and aired this information. Which if was sources wrong. are wrong, we find out sources are wrong. Yeah. And that's it. But we did not try. We, we were not trying to to force them into giving us some false narrative. You orchestrated this thing. And you dangled the carrot before the folks and they picked up on it to make it seem as if there was something in it for them mm. if they were going to take that narrative again and besmirch the image of Kenyans. That's what you did. Yeah. That's what you did. Yep. They're basically hiding behind that. Yeah. Uh, we are an independent media house. We cannot disclose the... Yeah, our journalists sources. will never reveal their source. We know. And Still. also, also we can't tell you then how we interacted with our sources. Criminals. Those things about oh, we signed contracts, signed contracts. But we look at the names that have been mentioned. Look at the individuals who've been mentioned in terms of signatures. The individuals who've been mentioned in would be doping. And it's clear that it's not the case because the individuals are still um, participating in these games. Imagine. Ah, pana. Do Imagine. The voice, the what? It's a long name. Okay. It's a very long name. Okay. You want me to read it? I'll try. I will try. Mm. It is called Documentar Compact Niet. Niet. Mm. Niet. Russian <laughs> means no. They should <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Documentar Compact Niet. Niet. Yeah. Let me tell you very quickly. Yes. Counties need to be very careful. They're on the edge as floods wreak havoc amid heavy rains. Several counties are on the edge of floods wreaking havoc, leading to the loss of lives and displacement of people. This is happening as heavy rains continue to pound parts of the country. In Narok, four family members died following a landslide in Olululunga from a night of heavy rains, while hundreds were displaced in Kisumu and West Pokot counties. Mm. The developments are bound to test the preparedness of counties to handle emergencies after similar floods last year left a trail of destruction and loss of lives. Yesterday, residents of Ololunga village were still struggling to come to terms with loss of members of one family. Narok South Sub-County Deputy County Commissioner Felix, uh, uh, Felix Kisalu said the mudslide occurred at night following heavy rains experienced in the area. Father, mother, son and daughter died in the incident. Now this is the thing that folks are asked to be on alert because there will be many more cases mm. like this. So can we be careful? The rain is already here, so you can't really prepare for it, can you? Yeah. The weatherman gave this forecast. If yeah. you remember, in January, mm. they, we were told, come April, we will see heavy, heavy prolonged rain. rains. Yeah. They did. Yeah. Are we prepared? 
Red Cross Secretary General will be with us at 9 a.m. He'll tell us um, what he's seeing on the ground. In the next hour, let's talk about traffic and what we are seeing, an increase, an upsurge in traffic accidents. What's causing this? How can we avoid it? The Matatu Welfare Association CEO will be with us at 7 a.m. Spice up your life. Good morning, this is Newswire. I'm Dennis Aceto. As every rains continue to be witnessed across the country, residents living near Lake Victoria are requested to be alert due to the possibility of flooding. Meteorological department warns that the heavy rains will continue in Siaya, Kisumu, Homa Bay, Megori, Kisi, Nyamira, Transoya, Baringo, Wasangishu, Elgeo, Marquette, Nandi, Nakuru, Naro, Kericho, Bomet, Kakamega, Viega, Bungoma, Busia and West Pokot counties. The weatherman David Gikungu says other areas that will be affected the most are Rift Valley, Northeast, including Marsabit, Mandera, Wajia and Isiolo. In Nyando area, Hombe County, more than 300 families have been left homeless due to the floods. In addition, in the western region, residents of Budarangi have been advised to move to safer areas due to the possibility of floods and landslides. Nirugu Basharia is the coordinator of the western region. We did our mapping sometimes back. We know which areas will be most affected. It is a region Busia is reading. Then we expect that there could be possible rad strides in the places of Viga, considering it's a very local place. Then there are also there could also be incidences of, of uh, flooding in areas of Kakamega County and uh, Bungoma is our safest place. And also we know we are aware that uh, we are people who are also involved in mining. And you know these at Sono miners are mostly doing it manually below the ground. And when they are very heavy rainforest there has been incidences of mines collapsing so we are appealing to our people to heed our warnings if they are supposed to move to higher grounds to move to higher grounds we are also advising our drivers to be more careful on our roads Kutu Secretary General Francis Atoll is optimistic as the new leader Rilo Dinka will clinch the African Union Commission chairmanship position due to the efforts of President William Ruto. Atoll has praised the President's efforts to support Odinga even though they have political differences now. Speaking on Citizen TV, Atoll has however said that if Rila does not win the position or rather become the chairperson, he still has the position of political leadership in the country. Raila Mododinka, who is my brother-in-law, he is a member of ODM, a leading as mere leader. But you know, when Ruto gets information, Raila will to become the chairman of the African Union. He just says, toa yo mesa, toa yo viti, kila kitu, nipe jacket. He's out without formal agreement, without handshake, without anything. Taking everybody unaware, including those in Azimio, including those in the ODM, including those in Kenya Kwanza. Kenya Kwanza moves fast to support the move. We at court, we say that is a good move. Section of legislators from Northeastern Kenya now calling upon the Director of Criminal Investigations to investigate allegations by former presidential candidate Cyrus Jirongo that the Moi regime dumped toxic waste in the region. Now the MPs wanted Jirongo to record a statement in regard to this revelation that the former president ordered toxins including nuclear waste to be dumped in the region and is now associated with the high cases of cancer reported in northeastern part of the country led by tabaj mp hussein abdibari and wajia south mp mohammed ado the legislators called on dci to summon jirongo over his allegations now police at malaba station in teso north of busia county intercepted 18 kgs of bang and 10 liters of changa which are being ferried to Kayo in Nairobi from Uganda. The operation also saw three women arrested as detectives confiscated the drugs. Confirming the incident, Teso North OZPD Joseph Matiko said they were tipped off by members of the public regarding the trio who looked suspicious. The three, who included an elderly woman, said it to be the mastermind of the deal, and two middle-aged men were found in possession of the substances and are now helping the police with further investigations.
And Chinese video sharing platform TikTok says it is ready to collaborate with the Kenyan government to keep its local community safe on the platform. This is in the wake of concerns that content shared on their popular platform promotes violence, sex, hate speech, vulgar language and offensive behavior. The executive officer of Bridget Connect Consultancy Bob Nolo lodged a petition in Parliament last year wanting TikTok banned in the country, turning it a threat to cultural and religious values. And do you live in Dagoreti, Langata, Ruaka, Lovington, Kilimani, Karin, Ngong, Rungai, and Kibera? Well, you must be careful while going about your business. This is after a rabid alert was issued by the Kenya Society for Protection and Care of Animals. Rabies is a viral disease spread to people and pets if they are beaten or scratched by a rabid animal, mostly dogs. While the disease is fatal, it is preventable through vaccinating pets and immediately seeking medical care after suspected exposure before symptoms start. This is News I'm Dennis Aseta. Good morning. A busy morning, yes it is. There's traffic coming in on the thicker superhighway and it's coming in from survey out towards the split between Moranga Road and Wangari Mathai. There you'll find no traffic, so that's good. Um, Globe Cinema around about traffic is getting into the city and it's not bad um, finally we're seeing the movement along Uhuru Highway and it's moving into the city so no holdups there it's fantastic coming in on Jogo Road as you get past the Makadara train station there's some traffic as you then approach Haile Selassie but it's all doable at least for now Kangunda Road some traffic as you get to that junction then joining with traffic coming in from Outer Ring let's take a quick look at what's coming in from Cabanas going out towards North Airport Road and then on to outer ring also just a little bit of that there we're not yet in traffic hour let's see what happens when we do get there and we'll talk in the meantime on spice fm ke on x this is the situation room the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, Pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. It's seven this seven. is the Welcome Situation Room, the, the only way to start your day. Back to work today after the weekend. Yesterday, yesterday was a weekend. Yesterday was a weekend. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just getting back to work, Karibu. But you're seeing people not on the road. No, not really, actually. Huh? Not really. Uh. People decided, okay, well, why? So people could have just taken a tea Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday Friday. Friday. And then come back. Hey, no, that's pushing it, man. Aye, that's too you know, much. That's Good too work, much. Buana. <laughs> Build the nation. Buana. So, how are you going to live? Hmm? How, how shall we pay doctors? <laughs> you don't work. So yeah. You can collect your taxes. Way, 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 way. Mm. Well, everybody who's joining us on KTN Home now, on Spice FM, on uh, Radio Garden, on our digital platforms, on YouTube and Facebook, Karibusana, we are glad you're here. I see a lion would like to have a conversation with you because I'm sure you have a plan. What's the plan? Mm. Hmm? Well, you know, you never know what your plan is. I'm just thinking about what of the, some of those plans could actually be. Do you want to buy a house in the future? Do mm. you want to go on holiday? Mm. Do you want to rack up school fees? Do you want to just have a nest egg, even if you're 15, 16, 20 years old? Do you want to, you know, have a nest egg for later? Do yeah. you want to travel for into your 30s? Mm. You know, every year for 10 years. Yes. And when you turn 30 kind of thing. Is that what you want to do? Do you want so early retirement? In, yeah, do you want early retirement? Do you want to make sure that you work now so that by the time you're 40, you're saying, you know what, I'm going to tone it down and I want enough to be able to live on for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, whatever you can imagine, ICEA Lion is going to help you 
activate that plan and what you need to do just go in and have a conversation and say you know this is what i want to do mm. i want to be able to go to one destination every year for 10 years by the time i turn 30 mm. and then they will tell you that is fantastic mm -hmm. we can make that happen if you do one two three so in order for you to find out what that one two three is give them a call send them an email go down and visit and they will sit the good folks there will sit down with you and say you know what this sounds great mm -hmm. Let's see how we can put it together mm. and we'll work on your plan and make it come to be. You've given the email. I have not. Plan at icelion.co.ke. Have mm. you given the website? I have not. Plan.icelion.co.ke. Fantastic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Social media handles ICEA Lion everywhere, including TikTok. Mm. You'll find them. And they're very, very responsive because ICEA Lion has decided, you know what, eh? people come to us we give them products no we should be sorting out people's issues individually everybody has an individual plan so just come we'll work on a plan together yes yes okay we'll soon be joined by patricia Mudeo. patricia is the matatu owners association ceo we'll be talking about what we are seeing on the roads and as we do that let me tell you about what uh, uh, Kipchumba Murkom in the road, the transport CS said the other day, mm -hmm. the government has once again spelled out new measures to curb road accidents following public outrage. The CS Kipchumba Murkom warned that passenger service vehicles which flout traffic regulations will be impounded and their owners or operators charged. He said they'll monitor the speed of PSVs and commercial vehicles, enforce the ban on overloading of goods and carrying excess passengers without PSV's contravening license routes. The ministry will also conduct compliance assessment of PSV's, circles, mount anti-drunk driving operations in roads, and conduct verification of NTSA-issued licenses to restore sanity on the roads. So far, nothing new, right? Mm. It's just enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. Mm -hmm. So why haven't they been enforced? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. So what has been happening all this time? Okay, let's continue. Mm. He said unlawful lights mounted on motor vehicles will also be removed. Ah, have you seen everybody now who buys at Yakab New big, big, big car puts those to strobe lights? On yeah, the then grill. they go and cover them with something yeah. because they're not allowed to. On the grill and then they're coming to more you on the road. Anyway, according to the ministries of transport, that of interior, they'll utilize a multi-pronged strategy that includes paying special attention to public education and risk targeted enforcement. Murkomen said they appointed 228 individuals to join the County Transport and Safety Committees two weeks ago and help drive enforcement in 38 counties. Yeah. Appointments to the remaining nine counties will be made in the coming days. This week, the National Police Service will appoint County Traffic Enforcement Coordinators to complement the work of the County Transport Safety Committees. The meeting was also attended, that one where Murkomen was speaking, mm. it was attended by the Principal Secretary in the State Department for Transport, Mohamed Dagar, Interior PS, Raymond Molo, IG of Police, Jafet Kome, NTSA Director General, George Njao. In the new rules, all learning institutions will be required to present their vehicles for inspection by the 1st of May, ahead of schools reopening. Mm. The exercise is aimed at assessing their mechanical soundness and whether their speed limiters are functional. School vehicles carrying children are restricted to operate between 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. There'll be immediate compliance requirements with KS2295-2018 standards on maximum road speed limiters for motor vehicles. All these things. So let's start with the first one. Okay. You have a yellow bus. Yes. It's written school X, school Y. Yes. School transport. Mm. Take it to NTSA for what? inspection for inspection yeah just the bus or the people who will be driving it also in the bus oh, okay remember what are you checking for the bus ntsa does inspections annually of vehicles they of vehicles. should do inspection annually yeah so you have a sticker that shows that you are mm. in compliance now whether that or not you should take your buses again for inspection all of them mm. what is informing this i wonder Mm. Is it that we have done a spot check and realized that the accidents that have been caused and they involve school buses have come out of the unsoundness of those vehicles to be on the roads? Hmm. Because you realize what we are saying, that in the next three weeks, all school buses countrywide must be re-inspected. Inspection is not free. No, it's not. You're paying for the inspection. 
what does this mean so what essentially we are saying is that mm. roadworthiness now is what is being um emphasized on mm. uh, for school buses yes right yes um to, and what 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 he sent were ensuring the safety of children mm. as they travel from point a to point b yes. to and fro school yes. um is this not done anyway annually it's done annually mm. in order for you to have the license to operate mm. isn't it so either it's been done or they're getting to the place whereby it will be done again in order for you to have your license to be on the road, your insurance, etc. Mm. So what would this particular one in this time then be insuring? We just, we, I don't know. We're checking to ensure. But you've done it already. Depending on the last time that you did it in the year 2023, yeah. you've already done it and you were given the tick. That's why you're on the road in the first place. Yes. Or is this a knee-jerk reaction to the things that we have been seeing in the last couple of and said, okay, well, school buses must all enter into this fray and we must check everybody. Because like you said, it is a requirement anyway for you to be on the road. Let's just talk about school buses, mm. ferrying children or doing whatever have to do with school you have to have had it anyway and it's a repetitive process every year you must have a psv sticker you must have a psv sticker and it's a valid one exactly yeah. and in order for you to receive the sticker there are certain you know hoops that you must have jumped through mm. you get that sticker yes you can't buy it in the store yes so what would have changed between the time that you got it in 2023 mm. because that's the period that we're in mm. and now i don't know I don't know. Granted, well, we have seen some accidents that involve school buses. Remember the KU one and for others. Sure. Okay. And, and also the one that w where the child here in, in Siokima was, was, was... Where the bus was reversing. And hit the child and, hit and the he child. died. So are we saying that it's because of the unroadworthiness of school buses that we have seen accidents involving school buses? Or are we saying we don't know, so we want to inspect? This is my problem. That when you put water to a fire, it's because something is burning and you know that because it's incinerator incineration and this water is going to kill the fire. Mm. Are we sure that now the measures that are being taken are going to be direct so solutions to this problem? And w what I would pray that would be avoided would be a lot of time and a lot of money, resources spent to work on something that is not going to solve the problem do you see mm. in the case where school vehicles school buses have been involved in accidents have we seen that it is as a result of unroadworthiness mm. is that the thing yes <laughs> that has caused the problem because if it is not we don't need to spend all this time because we, today we're on the 11th of April. Yep. Schools will open first, second, third, that through that week. Of May. First of week of May. May. Mm. Do, do we need to spend the time and resources to go through this licensure again mm. when they will still do it again by the end of the year mm. for 2024? Are we attacking the problem in the manner in which we ought to be? And I think, unfortunately, we spend a lot of resources wasting mm. most times because we knee-jerk to yep. some of these things. Which is why I say NTSA has got very many questions to answer, all right? So this is not on the Transport CS or even the Interior PS. There's an institution that's been established to basically come up with policies and programs on safety on our roads. Yeah. Okay? So what is it that we see? So we see the data that's uh, given out by NTSA and they collect this from the traffic police officers on the ground. It comes all the way to the traffic headquarters. Traffic headquarters compiles it, gives it to NTSA and says this is what we've seen. The number of accidents on a daily basis. What were they involving? Were they involving motor vehicles? Were they involving motorbikes? Were they involving just pedestrians? Were they involving bicycles? Whatever is happening on our roads, we can see it. Now, do we know what's causing this and that's why i was raising that issue the other day i was saying what are the my myriad of issues here is the issue the competence of drivers because there's been a conversation about retraining and retesting all drivers mm. is the issue the competence of the curriculum of um, driver training institutes those ones that have been 
accredited? Mm. Is the issue the testing that's done of new drivers by NTSA because NTSA does the test before issuing mm. a driving license? Is the issue there? Is the issue the enforcement of road traffic rules and regulations? Mm. Is the issue the design of the roads and the way the roads are, the, the, the state of roads? And if all those are issue in one way or another, how do we address them? Mm. And it's got to be long term. I'm seeing Moses Dorito is saying, you know, road safety is not an event. It's <laughs> it's a long term thing. Absolutely. You've got to think about it. It's a continuous thing. And that's why NTSA is there. Uh, what programs do you have that are long term that's saying this is what we shall do? How do you make sure that, for example, all the driver training institutes are actually conducting proper training of drivers? How do you make sure that when those uh, candidates go for tests at NTSA that the tests are sufficient to actually say yes we have seen that you actually know how to drive this class of motor vehicle or motorbike or whatever and once you're on the road how do you ensure that people continuously remember what those road signs are you remember what we were saying the other day in this country on our roads it has become this thing of it keep left and less overtaking mm, uh, story. it's a story mm. you as long as it's a dual carriage you keep right <laughs> keep the extreme right you're and doing you well going. you know and you keep going so what is it that we are addressing here absolutely and I what's causing these accidents absolutely and i think that this is the unfortunate thing is that there have been accidents there's been more we've talked about in the last three months how many people have how many accidents have there been mm. on the roads and how many people have died quite a number of those but are we using the data because there's data that's being given here yeah. are we using the data of the character of some of these accidents to say okay then this is what we ought to be addressing one of the things that you mentioned in this which you've read mm. is that containing the issues of flouting traffic rules containing the issues of overloading in public service vehicles yeah. which many times lead to accidents yeah. these two issues when we talk about continuous processes are we actually making sure that folks on the road are adhering to the rules too many a time what do we know who are the people on the roads who are supposed to make sure these things are happening more often than not it's the police mm. more often than not it's the trans it's the traffic police so we also know that there's heavy 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 compromise when it comes to um traffic police on yep. our roads today yep. that you can give a note or whatever and they'll forget about the mistake that you have made mm. but how many of those can be traced from you on the highway who's overloaded your vehicle to that vehicle ending up in an accident when you choose to overtake into head into oncoming traffic mm. there have been many a case mm. are we dealing with that issue who the folks who are supposed to, who are the vanguards of making sure that we don't have this kind of overloading on the roads that we don't have the flouting of traffic rules over mm. and over again are we dealing with that problem yep are we really dealing with these issues we, we are not we are not looking at it holistically no. if you think about what a safe system looks like and we started with first of all the infrastructure mm. are the roads safe right do you have everything on a road that we can say this road is safe for use okay a uh, speed limits and this is driver behavior and observers of the speed limits mm. but also at the same time proper signage that tells you road on this particular road at this particular section you will do 50 this is do, this is the speed that you're observing mm. so that then you say the driver is not observing the set speed limits mm -mm. a are our roads safe for the users all users including pedestrians a majority of those that have died this year from road accidents over 400 445 these are pedestrians yeah so how did vehicles knock pedestrians down mm. what happened were the pedestrians crossing the road was that a designated crossing area do we have proper designated and marked crossing areas were they walking on the side of the road or were well, they walking no on the road because yeah. there's nowhere to walk what is it that's the safety of the road if we talk about the vehicles themselves yes and the inspection happens every 12 months psvs and uh, heavy commercial vehicles are inspected to be allowed to be on the road by mm. ntsa mm. so if the inspection is working if we have speed governors that have been installed and one of the inspection uh, items is checking that a psv has got speed governors 
as those speed governors working do we say that when a vehicle goes for reinspection at the end of the 12 months ntsa guys are able to download the data from the speed governor and see that at no point did you switch off the speed governor in the last 12 years in the mm. last 12 months mm. and at no point did you flout because what's the point of having a speed governor if you're not going to be checking right there's no point so all these things is it what we are addressing no. Because we are forming committees, we are forming committees, we are saying let's reinspect, we let it, 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 it. Imagine and if let's you take all the vehicles back, let's retrain. Right? Every yeah. driver should go to be inspected. Everything we're talking about is a, is a cost. Absolutely. This is money, 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 money. Yeah. So now imagine if you were in a position whereby your vehicle has been inspected, everything has met the mark, you have gone through retraining on paper, you've passed it with a great A, uh. but you have terrible manners on the road you just have bad manners on the road yeah how are we dealing with that issue because that is the case mm. a lot of people's ends up looking when we talk about you know over speeding when we talk about you know just not following traffic rules is that a vehicle issue it is not it's not it has, is that a license issue it is not are you able to drive and drive well yes you are but mm. you just have bad manners are we dealing with those issues we are not. That you can see oncoming traffic, but you still choose at this point that I am going to overtake or I'm going to see if I can just make it by a whisker mm. so that I can get where I'm going mm. a lot quicker. Are we dealing with those issues? Is that an issue of retraining? Yeah. Is that an issue of licensure? Is that an issue of inspection? How do we deal with those issues and why are we not approaching those as problems that need to actually then be solved? Oh, those are approached as problems. You see those uh, cops on the road? Mm. Oh, you cross the double uh, uh, continuous line. Oh, you're speeding and this and the other. But then how do you deal with those? How do you deal with it? And how has that been And how do you come up with deterrence? Because you know, these things, by the way, with a proper deterrent system, people will toe the line eventually. What's causing this driver behavior? I keep asking, what causes driver behavior? When people get to a point where you start seeing people overlapping, why are people overlapping? Mm. What is it that is ingrained in our system that you see an accident, Kidogo, Kidogo, you know, here. Gridlock is coming. In 20 minutes, mm. I'll be stuck here for four hours. Mm. So the best thing I want to do is try and get out of this as soon as possible. Mm. Overlap. Shida. You make it worse. Why do we have such issues? What anyway, our guest has arrived. Patricia Mudeo is the CEO of the Matatu Owners Association. Good morning, Patricia. Good morning. How, How are, are you? you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Very well. Paul Asana, you got stuck in Matatu traffic. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was lucky to access expressway. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's I just missed break. my exit. Ah, that <laughs> happens. Yeah. Driver behavior. You don't read the signage. <laughs> See, you know what you're talking about. Mm. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't the one driving. Driver behavior. <laughs> you don't read the signage. <laughs> Let's take a break. We'll come back and, com and start our conversation with you shortly. It's 27 minutes past seven. Patricia Mudeo, the CEO of the Matatu Owners Association, is our guest. She's joined us now. We're going to be talking about road safety on our roads. Are we doing enough? What should be done? Particularly when it comes to PSVs. And then let's also come to personal vehicles. Mm. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Embark on an unforgettable journey through the heart of Africa at the Festac Africa Festival 2024, destination Kisumu. Join us from May 20th to 26th for Africa's celebration of global culture, fashion, music, dance, and more. Immerse yourself in a week-long extravaganza featuring professionals from across the continent as we explore the theme of sustainable growth trajectory for Africa through culture, trade, travel, and tourism. Don't miss this opportunity to experience the vibrant diversity and boundless energy of Africa in just seven days. Waruakidala. I've got a plan to make my investment sing better than I do under the shower. <coughs> <coughs> 
la 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 ICEA Lion has a plan for everyone. Talk to us today for a plan that's right for you. Or visit icealion.co.ke. ICEA Lion. This what? morning we'll see highs of 27 and lows of 16. It's cloudy at 16 in, in Nakuru with highs of 27. 26 will be the high in a mostly cloudy area at 16. And at 14, Eldoret is cloudy. We'll see highs of 25. Looking into Mombasa, sunny at 28 with highs of 33. And 33 will be the high in a mostly cloudy Malindi at 29. It's 21 and sunny in Kisumu with highs of 29. While Kakamega will see highs of 29. It's currently cloudy at 18. In Kampala, it's cloudy at 21 with highs of 28, while Dar es Salaam, mostly cloudy at 26, will go to highs of 32. 9 degrees and sunny in Johannesburg with highs of 20, while looking into a sunny Mogadishu at 29, we'll see highs of 33. 15 and sunny in Addis Ababa with highs of 25, while in Lagos, it's cloudy at 28 with highs of 33, and Kinshasa is clear at 25, going to highs of 34. up your life. The Eastern Bypass touching on Outer Ring all the way to the Thicker Superhighway on that direction, not too bad. You'll get to survey on the Thicker Superhighway and that slows down. Uh, traffic getting out towards the CBD, very tight. Still for movement, uh, then movement as you get towards uh, the Globe Cinema Overpass and then you're stuck. Don't know why that's happening this morning. Uhuru Highway is open so that should not be an issue unless folks are still dealing with the dregs of last week's trauma. Um, so let's watch out for that roundabout action. Let us know what might be going on. Just just in case something different from what um, we had experienced before. As coming out of Westerns, you're all right. There's not much traffic coming off of Ngong Road. But Langata Road, as you get towards Aerodrome, also then has packed up a proper one getting towards Bunyala Road. Um, so let's watch out for that as we're getting into traffic hour now. We'll keep an eye on things. Talk to us, folks, on Spice FM, KE, on X, hashtag The Situation Room. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM. So Patricia, the Matatu Owners Association, of course you represent Matatus on the road. Yes. And is it all Matatus or is it just the members? It's all, not all actually. We mm -hmm. command 80% of uh, registered SACO mm -hmm. in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, uh, we have over 400, 480 registered SACOs Sacos. under us. Yes, mm -hmm. Matatu Owners Association mm -hmm. is an advocacy docket that champions the rights and also the needs of, uh, actually highlights the needs of Matatu owners yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Yes. We've seen many times when we see road accidents, there will be a PSV vehicle involved, a Matatu involved. And uh, of course the spotlight then comes to you as the Matatu owners. What's happening in your sector? I, I think I'd like to correct that. Mm -hmm. It's not always Matatu involved, mm. or rather, mm. vehicles involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if we actually going to isolate that word Matatus, then we definitely become a target in regard when it comes to crackdowns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we all know why we become targets. So let me say that the way I said it again. Yeah, many of the accidents that we see on our roads yeah. will involve passenger service vehicles yes okay yeah and many of them belong to one sack or another yes okay yeah so what is it that say uh, causes us to see like matatus are constantly involved in or matatus and buses are constantly involved in accidents maybe if we just take a few uh, like study of what has happened recently mm. a pro box has been involved in a road accident mm. a school bus mm. and a matatu yes 
those are two different those are three different entities that's true so again i revert to the same question it's not matatu mm. it's anyone who is a road user becomes uh, a culprit of of an accident of an accident okay yes now that of course many of your vehicles are on the road yeah. constantly throughout you must have gathered a lot of information just looking at observation wise you can see what's happening on our roads what from your perspective is causing the many road accidents that we are seeing currently i will say one of the key causes is poor infrastructure uh Every year we have an increment of uh, vehicle carrying passengers from point A to B, but we still maintain the same infrastructure. So, of course, uh, every expansion warrants also an expansion in, 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 in regards to where people operate. Mm. Yeah, so I will say one, poor infrastructure yeah. and engineering. Mm. Yes. Mm. Uh, explain, expo explain, expound on that a bit. What do you mean? What when you say poor infrastructure? What exactly do you poor refer roads, to? Poor roads, lack of uh, walking path. Uh, you know, infrastructures can really solve uh, a big part mm. of uh, the mess mm. or the carnage we see around. Mm. For instance, when you look at. Um, Thicker super highway. Yeah. Uh, some times ago, uh, before it was restructured, mm. there was a lot of traffic and overlapping. Mm. But right now, whether you like it or not, because of uh, uh, great engineering, you just have to follow one, you know, lane until you get to where mm. uh, you want to be. So overlapping becomes. Um, it has been reduced significantly. It has not actually. It has reduced completely. Mm. Yeah. So I'll say that mm. those are the things that needs to be looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, a case of uh, Sachang, Sachang one. Yes. You remember it was rampant um, a, a while ago. Yeah. But the moment they introduced the dual carriage, mm -hmm. we definitely we said I mean the accidents really went down. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So I'll say one of the key reasons, one of the key, um, uh, one of the key causes mm. of accident mm. is poor infrastructure mm. poor uh road signage mm -hmm. poor lighting yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay yes where do you think driver behavior um falls into the area of accidents that we see uh, regularly on the roads where do you think this all plays in in this that has been one of our biggest challenges because honestly, we don't have uh, adequate training facilities, mm. or rather, we don't have credited national training facilities for drivers varying our public. And I think uh, we've been in, in consultation with different uh, institutions mm. in, uh, in government to ensure we come up with a curriculum and also um, an accredited uh, training institution for our driver, our Matatu drivers, to enhance behavior change mm. and also uh, ascertain their credibility of their driving license. Okay. Yes. So you're saying an accredited PSV driver training school? Yes. Why is this important? It is very important because in other countries, mm. uh, you actually can't be allowed. Uh, to drive with, with without proper training mm. and certified driver's license. So I don't know why we allow that in Kenya. But Mr. We, we, we have driver's licenses yes. that are only issued by one entity, that's the government. Exactly. The tests before you receive this license are only conducted by one entity, that's NTSA. Yeah. The driving, driver, driving schools that we have in this country are all accredited and licensed by government. You'd assume that all this thing that we are saying, then that means that you have a unified curriculum, a unified method of testing, and a unified uh, licensing. 
Unified licensing, yes. Mm -hmm. And if you agree with me, NTSA was just constituted just the other day. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the main things they do is renewal of the driving license. I have a driver's license, but I've never gone f uh, to NTSA for training or uh, what do you call it? The, the, the process is not seamless. Mm -hmm. The process of renewing your driver's license? Exactly. No, okay. no, no, no. It's not seamless. Mm -hmm. NTSA was, uh, was just established just there. I think 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by that time, we had matatus. So again, it becomes very hard to ascertain when I'm going back for a renewal. Mm -hmm. Am I properly trained? Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you ascertain that? And you're ferrying public on a daily basis. Okay. Yeah. So what you're advocating for is for a PSV driver to have their license renewed, they need to be retested. Oh, definitely. Right. They really need to be retested because it's not just retesting. Mm. When you go to this institution, how we are rethinking the whole curriculum, yeah. there's a lot of things that will be emphasized. You know, there is ATK, there is a customer relation, there is, um, what do you call it? Um, road manners mm. yeah mm. yeah once that is instilled we all agree education is key to lots of successes mm. and most of them like that mm. you know someone starts as a conductor before you know they graduate into ferrying people mm. and we cannot ignore mm. corruption is one of our biggest problem we have in this country mm. so it becomes very hard mm. to ascertain mm. whether this person is trained well trained to ferry public or not Okay. So we really need to revise that, mm -hmm. yeah. Because right now with the circles, it becomes very easy to regulate um, how certain circles behave. Mm -hmm. And I would like to pick up uh, one of the circles called 4NT and 2NK. Mm -hmm. They're one of the best well-behaved, and actually they are our members, mm -hmm. yeah. So if we bring back the capacity building within the circles mm -hmm. and enforce, instead of crackdown, proper training of our drivers definitely will be achieving something okay yeah do you think it needs to look at the softer underbelly of this issue as well because we can talk about training you i mean the very basic one two threes of knowing how to drive the issues of having the proper licenses to then be able to be on the roads in terms of a psv and all of that going through vehicle inspection you can have all your ducks in a row in terms of what you need the you know brick and mortar but then there is the softer side whereby we're talking about discipline we're talking about road manners we're talking about road rage we're talking about a historic attitude that hangs over particular road users how do you think that needs to be addressed because we can be honest that in a lot of cases where we but we do see an accident that involves a PSV, it's somebody who couldn't wait two seconds. Mm -hmm. It's somebody who wanted to, you know, scream at somebody else who was using the road and an accident has occurred. Mm. It's somebody who was going to overtake when there's oncoming traffic and we've seen the loss of lives. We can't run away from that reality. What do you think needs to be done? Because I do believe that in this, there's not one person. In what we've seen in the last months, there's not one sector or one individual that can be blamed. Everybody has a part to play. So now in the part where we talk about indiscipline on the roads mm -hmm. and lack of manners on mm -hmm. the roads, what do you think needs to be done to be able to claw back on some of these things? Because I personally don't believe it is an issue of inspecting your vehicle because you can have a brand new vehicle and you can have... A, somebody can be a fantastic driver but they got a stinking attitude mm. and we put them on the road the sector still carries unfortunately that image how can we a approach that issue I think I'd like to go back to my previous comment mm. when I said infrastructure engineering whether you like it or not mm. there is a way if we achieve a different design, whether you like it or not, you'll be conformed, you'll, you'll conform to behave in a certain you'll way. You'll behave in a certain way. Whether you like it or not. Mm. And that's where also now uh, the Ministry of Roads comes in. Mm. Because once the road is designed in a certain way, mm. whether you want to overlap or you don't want to overlap, there is no way out. You just have to follow the queue. 
as we also embark on driver training right and capacity building mm -hmm. it's a collective responsibility mm -hmm. yeah and i'll also want also to bring the the ball back to the passengers who are being ferried mm. you have a right to tell the driver not to you can't tell me 33 versus one honestly 33 passengers and yeah, one driver exactly mm. because at the end of the day it's 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 your life in line it's your family that's going to go home without fathers and mothers. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's a collective responsibility. For us to achieve um, comprehensive, beautiful roads, we really, we really have to be vigilant. Okay. Yeah. The measures that have been um, announced by government, um, first of all, like, reinspect all the school buses. Yeah. That's number one. Yeah. But then... Beyond that, there's what the CS had announced earlier and then he had suspended and said, now we have got to go back into this. We've got to retest all PSV drivers, retest all heavy commercial drivers. Do you support that move? Do you think it's, it's important for us right now to conduct a fresh test for all your drivers in, for example, the PSV sector and do a complete retest for all drivers in heavy commercial vehicles and then maybe go on into the other civilian drivers? I think I would have approached it differently. Mm -hmm. First, I would have embarked on a series of research uh, to be able to identify what the problem is, why are we having increment and in, in, uh, road carnage. Okay. Yeah. Then after that, I'd use the research to implement because now, again, we cannot be make it the wicked decision, reaction of decision just because something has happened. We are not actually. Um, curing the disease mm. you know and i think uh, there's a need to establish research institutions before mm. we just go out and you know make certain statements of course it's important to retest and then actually again that shows laxity on their side which means they were never retested mm. that's why they're not sure whether we have credible drivers on the roads and the question is why what went wrong who slept in their job mm. yeah and if in the first place these people were on the road without not without being tested mm. that's a problem that's an issue mm. that is an issue mm. yeah that is an issue and how sure are we that the test will be done to the right population that will help the road carnage go down mm. that's another issue yeah because every time there is a crackdown number one target is matatu mm. and why is that definitely you know we ferry cash we are mini banks mm. from point a to b mm -hmm. yeah and we, the drivers and the conductors they have a target to meet so that at the end of the day they can give some money to the owner mm. and they don't want to be stopped so it becomes as like you create an avenue for corruption and that needs to stop if at all we are really really genuine into bringing down the road carnage issue so what i'm hearing from you basically you're saying that even as you embark on this immediate you can just say these are emergency measures yes but ideally this should be informed by proper data absolutely and, and we're even saying that before you go you got in here this is the job that NTSA has as the body responsible for developing policies on road safety in the country. Yeah. Those policies should be data driven. So how much data, what data. do we know exactly. about yeah. the road situation, the safety of our yeah. roads in our country, infrastructure wise, driver wise, vehicle wise, behavior wise, uh, pedestrian wise, all road users, what do we know about that? So we don't have that. But then you're also saying that you would like, and I want to come back to this point where you're saying, the Matatu Owners Association is advocating for one institution that is either established by government or accredited by government where all PSV drivers go through it yeah. for training before they are given a, lo a, road, a, a driver's license. Are you saying that you don't have confidence in the current structure where we have many licensed um, driving schools? I would say, 
yes and no. Mm -hmm. Start with the yes. Yes, because definitely, I mean, I'm a trained driver, so mm. at least I can ascertain you can. <laughs> there's some element of truth. Yes, I'm there's going some, There's some training. training that happens. Yes. Mm -hmm. But how do you accredit that I'm properly trained? You see, I'm, I'm trying to base, I'm, I'm trying to borrow from maybe the aviation, mm -hmm. the maritime. Mm -hmm. There is accreditation that you're properly trained. There is, um, what do you call it? Continuous assessment. The, yeah, there is that act, continuous assessment. Assessment. You have to go back mm -hmm. because you're fearing public. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that the case with matatus? No. Mm. You train once twenty years ago. You That's it. keep mm -hmm. renewing. Exactly. You keep renewing, and you're fearing thirty-three lives in a span of one and a half hours. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a case study? Is there any country that has this thing that you're talking about? Of course. Tell I us. mean, when you go to Sweden... Tell us how they work. Yeah. First, the mm. public transport. Actually, it's not public transport. They, there is no public transport. It's owned by the government. Mm -hmm. So, th I think Kenya is among the countries that public transport is purely owned by... So then Private it's actually sector. not public sector. It's public. not public exactly. transport. Yeah. Exactly. On the other side, it would be public transport. Exactly. It's government owned. On, yes. In Kenya, there's actually Kenya. no public transport. Mm, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's private owned. Mm -hmm. But this is an institution that should not just be let to operate by itself. We mm -hmm. need some regulation because you're fearing the citizens of Kenya which needs to be protected and who can protect them it's the mandate of the government to protect its citizen mm -hmm. by making sure the people work for them and especially uh, matters life mm. are well trained well certified mm. even if it's a private institution mm. yeah would it be would it make sense then, um, from what you're saying, and who would be the body then who would work on something like this? Because I, I do think right now that those, uh, everybody who's trying to grapple with the solution right now is trying to say, okay, so who would it be? Would it be NTSA? Would it be a special committee under the Ministry of um, um, Roads and Roads Transport? And transport? Uh, um, who, would it be those who understand what it's supposed to be would set this up to have a department whereby there was continuous assessment of this particular sector because they do make up close to the majority of the vehicles on the road in Kenya today, whether it is short-term travel within cities and towns yeah. or long-term travel. Uh, over four hours on the highways, right? So who would that be and what would make sense? And what would they be looking for to make sure that, you know, uh, beyond your wits being about, that you are actually following and that you are aware of what the rules are? Who, who would that be and what would make sense? Who would that be? That should be NTSA because they mm -hmm. are the regulatory body mm -hmm. of public, every public transport. Mm -hmm. So the buck stops with them. And how often do you think, take a Matatu um, operator, for example. So now here we are looking at the driver and conductor, or how many, how many ever there are for a vehicle. Mm -hmm. What kind of a regularity would be required for this continuous assessment? A year? Six months? Things change? What, what would make sense? It should be a continuous process. Every what? A, yeah. Every not every every day it should be a continuous. it should be an assessment every day no 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 not, not an assessment okay. <laughs> no 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 no, no. Uh -huh. we should have people on the road mm -hmm. okay who should be able to identify that maybe that vehicle is not uh, being driven well mm -hmm. there is a need to establish um what do you call it um the road cameras and i think uh was there a more common actually um he said that they would he said they would call them Telemat. Yes. Mm. There is a need to automate mm. Mm -hmm. our whole traffic system that you don't have to stop to pay fines and all that. Yeah. There is a need to put there is a need to put cameras on our roads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What do you think should happen where there is a flouting? Because in the things that he mentioned yesterday, which we read on report today, there are two things that came into play. Flouting of traffic rules and things like overloading, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What do you think should happen 
what do you think should be should that be on the spot fines like we see happening in tanzania you should if you break the speed limit if we check your car for example and you do not have a working speed governor you do not have seat belts you do not have this that the other thing which again we're looking at are the causes of accidents over speeding lack of proper safety infrastructure etc etc you don't have those things spot fines or are we saying uh, there should be some kind of uh, deterrent that should be put in place so that in your head as an operator then you know, okay, if I do not follow the rules, there is a punishment. And so automatically it makes me want to say, look, for anything else, I don't want to get in trouble. So let me abide by the rules. What mm. should that look like? Uh, I, I'm in support of instant fines, mm. but let them be friendly. Mm. It, once you make them hefty, you introduce... Uh, corruption channel. Mm. Let them be friendly because mm. also as Kenyans, we really need to support our governments to pay its bill, mm. its it, it, it bills. Mm -hmm. So le b I support instant fines, but let them be uh, friendly. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Do a, uh, like um, yeah. Let them be, be doable, and then in every um, every floor of the traffic rules. Mm. The driver's license should be like put on red. Mm -hmm. That will make it difficult for them to renew their licenses when the time comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that will make them be responsible. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when the whole concept of putting matatus under circles was introduced, I think it was Amos Kimunya when he was transport minister and said all matatus get into circles, and this is soon after Michuki had done this whole thing. In fact, it was Michuki again this whole thing of let's have order in this sector one of the things the ideas behind it was self-regulation yeah so it allows one route being under one circle and the circle then is also helping regulation in management of the drivers in seeing that there's safety in seeing that there's observers and adherence to the rules so but owners association you said 80 percent of the circles countrywide yeah. are your member yes. so you're an umbrella circle of circles yeah what are you doing on in terms of self-regulation oh. so all those issues that we've talked about ensuring that drivers are competent drivers yes ensuring that drivers who are on the road are actually deserving to be on the road ensuring that drivers who flout rules are punished uh, properly and that there's something that happens to them before they get to renew their license mm -hmm. what, are, what are you doing in, on that front what are we doing we've embarked on a serious road safety campaign mm. Mm across Kenya. So far we've done over 10 road safety campaigns uh, within different uh, in police institutions and I would say the feedback has been amazingly good. Mm. The reception is amazing. Mm. We're seeing over two, a minimum, yeah, a minimum of 200 vehicles coming in for inspection mm -hmm. and they're able to be advised like you need to repair this your 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 your, your, your motor vehicle is like 80 percent compliant or 50 percent compliant mm -hmm. and i would say this has been made possible by the the commandant mm -hmm. traffic commandant madame omari mm -hmm. and of course uh, different stakeholders um one of them being uh, kcb suzu and um which other company and NTSA mm -hmm. recently joined. Mm -hmm. So I can say there's a lot of goodwill, and that is the direction we want to go. We've been in uh, Eldoret, Bungoma, and all these road safety campaigns, we're doing them either in a police station mm. or in a Matatu terminus. Mm. Yeah, And that is the also a, 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 a platform that you get to talk to our drivers. We've also partnered with an ACADA because we've realized there's a r lot of uh, mental health issues, okay, mm. within our ecosystem. Mm. So we are actually trying to have uh, an approach that will be holistic to make sure we deliver good drivers on the road. Mm. We, I, as, as an association, we try as much as we can despite having financial constraints mm -hmm. i say I, I always say like we've tried to do something yeah do you have a set of um driving schools that you say these ones are accredited by mm -hmm. moa if a driver comes with a license showing that they actually trained here a certificate from the school we trust them more than none other, any other unfortunately no 
No. And again, um, the process of acquiring a PSV is also long and tedious. Mm. Because once you train, you're required to stay out for like four years before you drive a PSV. Mm. You can imagine. Is that credible? No. So these are the things that you want to revise once an institution, a PSV driving school institution is established. Mm. Yes. And we have enough space. We have TVET that we can partner with. Mm. So we are just waiting for the government to goodwill. Okay. Yeah. Because it is our responsibility. It is your responsibility because we are all road users. Okay. Yeah. Patricia, thank you for joining us today. Come again soon. This is a conversation that will keep happening Thank over you. and over again. Yeah. Patricia Mudeo is the CEO of the Matatu Owners Association. We'll be talking about road safety. In the next hour, we talk about corruption. An MP is joining us. 8 a.m. Good morning. Good morning, this is Newsworm Dennis Aseto. Thicke residents have been urged to keep politics and politicians out of realization of Thicke Industrial Smart City as an ad hoc committee is inaugurated by Governor Kimanyo Matangi. The ad hoc committee, appointed according to the Urban Areas and Cities Act to spearhead the elevation of Thicke Town into a smart city, were handed the appointment letters at Kiambu County Government Headquarters in Kiambu Town. They include Sylvia Kasanga, Zakari Nganga, Cecilia Mwangi, Gitu Kahengeri, T.G. Ndorogo, Gianta Wairigi and Julie. As Masharia. The team is to commence work immediately where they are supposed to do a Thika city and conduct public participation. They would also visit both Thika East and West Towns and later prepare a report that will be presented to the County Assembly for approval. This will later be taken to the Senate for approval. The process is expected to take six months. The dub leaders led by Area MCA Mohammed Abdi Farah commended the security operators working in the areas for working round the clock to ensure peace and security. The leaders will include MCAs and peace elders appreciated the dedication and commitment the security operators had displayed to thwart the would-be threat in the area. Speaking after Eid prayers, MCA Farah said cases of insecurity have drastically dropped thanks to the close working relationship between the security operators and Wananchi. Kakamega Governor Fernandez Barraza has voiced his sentiments against the new sugar sector tax and payment charges. Governor Barraza urged members of parliament to amend the respective provision of the Finance Act 2023, specifically those requiring farmers to pay additional taxes by registering on the e teams platform. The governor said Kakamega County's economy heavily depends on farming and the implementation of the new tax regulation will have significant adverse effects on the region. The Kenya National Highways Authority has announced the reopening of a section of the Nairobi Garissa Highway closed due to flooding. The authority disclosed that it had completed an initial repair of the section of road swept away by floods. Kenya announced the closure of the Nairobi Garissa Road due to flooding in the area between Bangalay and Madogo after heavy rains led to rising water levels along the stretch. Surging water at Tana River flooded the Maroro area between Madogo and Tana River on the same road, trapping a Garissa bound bus with 51 passengers on board. The vehicle was swept away by the flood waters. Some passengers managed to escape while others climbed the roof as they waited to be rescued. Now, the Ethics and Anti Corruption Commission has filed an appeal against the April 8th judgment revoking the suspension of Ketrako General Manager Anthony Wamukota. In a statement, EACC said it is dissatisfied with the judgment delivered by Econo Employment and Labor Relations Court Judge Bairam Ongaya, saying it will jeopardize ongoing investigations. Mukota, General Manager in charge of Design and Construction, is among several top public officials suspended following a directive by the Chief of Staff and Head of Public Service Felix Kuske on recommendations of EACC. The officials were suspended to protect the integrity of ongoing Investigations EACC said the court ruling could have far-reaching implications on ongoing efforts to combat corruption in the country.
Now, energy consumption in electric mobility has surged in the past year, signaling increased adoption of electric mobility options in the country. The Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority reported a rise in energy consumption from 29,097 kilowatt hours in July 2023 to 75,729 kilowatt hours in December 2023 in a report. Now, however, given the high presence of renewable energy, APRA is assertive that the country's capability to support e infrastructure structure is not in doubt. The rise in electric mobility adoption in the country signifies a gain in momentum for the government's campaign to decarbonize the transport system. The transition to cleaner mobility is a strategic move aimed at reducing carbon emissions and fighting climate change. Now, Tana River County is said to have the first ever museum with a rich ancient history that dates back to more than 120 years. Already, the National Museums of Kenya is rehabilitating a mission rebuilding built by the Germans between 1900 and 1902 in Ngao village in the newly created Tarasa sub county. The museum is said to promote the rich history of evangelism spearheaded by the Germans who settled in the sleepy village. This is News I'm Dennis Aceto. Good morning. One hundred two point five Spice FM, Kisumu. Roundabout heading out into um, onto Uhuru Highway, pretty busy right about now. We're looking at Hospital Road coming out of Upper Hill, also busy. It's touching from Gong Road, so folks who are trying to get away um, from community with that traffic that's happening there kind of got stuck. Um, then trying to approach. Uh, Uhuru Highway and then out towards the CBD. So that's busy. It's also busy coming off of State House Road. We've got some traffic on Ring Road Westland. Coming off of Thicker Super Highway, there is some as well. Kiambu Road, not so much, which is actually interesting around this time. Getting towards Muthaiga Square is busy. And as you're coming off for the first time in a long time, Limuru Road, there's traffic then approaching Muthaiga and then getting into Limuru Road. Okay, so there's pockets of traffic here and there manageable at the moment and nothing too out of whack let's keep an eye on things it's a few minutes after eight o'clock let's see what happens in about half an hour or so we'll talk on spice of mke on x hashtag the situation room This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom, in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, Pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation it's Room, the only way to start your day. Welcome to the third hour of the conversation this morning. Um, our next guest is a member of parliament, Titus Lotter, MP Kachaliba constituency. The last time we invited him, he had an issue in the morning and he got slightly late. Uh, today, he's slightly late, mm. but uh, hopefully he's on the way. He'll come and we have a conversation with him, finally. The issue of public transport and safety on our roads has you know very many very many facets to it right and we've talked about it so what is the cause yeah. what's causing the accidents um there are those that say it is purely 100 percent or 98 percent driver behavior mm. we are badly behaved on the roads we are causing accidents there are those that say it is because of police Police are not doing the job that they should be doing. Police are only out there to collect money and eat. And also, let's bring NTSA back onto the road students to join the police and eat bigger. No, the other part is mine. <laughs> that was yours. Uh, yeah, that's mine. Uh, then there are those that say it's the road itself, the infrastructure, the design of the roads. And then we have a problem completely here with everything that's working. Mm. What is it? 
which is which we'd like to hear from you as we wait for the mp for kachalibo constituency 0719012600 also post your comments on our social media x spice fm ke facebook spice fm and youtube as well spice fm what is it that what do you think is the biggest problem and contributor to the road accidents that we're seeing on our roads at present and what we've been seeing for a long time what is the biggest contributor to this problem mm. yeah i mean if if i'm a contributor to this conversation already mm. i think that there's not one um and i think that there's a shared space um between proper infrastructure on the roads mm -hmm. of the roads not on the roads proper infrastructure of the roads mm. and we're talking about signage we're talking about smooth roads we're talking about marked roads we're talking about well lit roads uh um just that general knowledge we're talking about road infrastructure whether that be pedestrian and bicycle um pathways whether we're talking about over what well, i keep forgetting the name of these things footbridges thank you footbridges mm. uh we're talking about those in as many are needed for the population of people who are using or accessing these roads mm. so when i talk about road infrastructure i'm talking about all of that mm. i'm talking about road design and i think that it is and has been historically inadequate and then I'm also going to put way up there as well, mm. road user behavior. Mm. Road user behavior is not road user expertise. Mm. It's behavior. Mm. And that's a psyche thing. It's not your skill or talent as a driver. It is your behavior. It is the desire to want to overtake when you can see there's oncoming traffic. Mm. It is the desire to say, well, you know what? I'm in a hurry and I didn't leave yesterday and all these other people, forget them, I'm going to go ahead even when there is a uh, need for me to wait. Mm -hmm. um, road user behavior means that uh, it doesn't matter how if they've asked me to carry three people, I'm going to go ahead and carry 17. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. That The part where it is difficult to legislate is the part where we see the most danger. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put it up to those two and I'm going to say these are the reasons why we see high um accidents and loss of lives on the roads mm -hmm. for me those are the two ones that those are the ones that should be a approached and, a and attacked voraciously to say something needs to be done here yeah you cannot then have roads that are unmarked unlit unsmoothened you don't have road infrastructure people need to cross the road you don't have pathways people are on their own merry way walking along the road and a car comes from nowhere lost its brakes and mashes them into smithereens yeah. this is what we are talking about yeah. have we made sure that all of those things have been done before we now move to the next stage and then also for you and your manners when you're on the road it is not just you you share the road with other people mm. how do you behave you know how do you mark or gauge the speed of the person who is coming on the other side in their right yep. and you've overtaken on the wrong side of the road these are the things that we're talking about and for, for, for me those are the two those are the biggest causes that have to be looked into mm. in which order well what comes first infrastructure first or road infra user first infrastructure for me comes user first. first okay infrastructure for me comes first mm. yeah i agree with you mm. uh although for me 90 percent is infrastructure and i'm going to ask her a quick question if you don't mind moses is okay. asking how many accidents happen happen on rural unpaved roads but this is the thing right here that when we look at the statistics and the data that we are given the accidents that are causing death in the country today are in urban supposedly paved areas very few accidents happen in the rural area reported reported yeah okay so many we're, we're, accidents happen in rural and paved roads involving motorbikes mm, motorbikes and things like that yes so here we go and you don't do you have how many how many vehicles do you have on the rural and paved roads actually operating there exactly that's the other thing when you see when a road is paved there are more matatus there's more transport happening on that on that road so you'll have more road users Be by virtue of the <laughs> fact that it has been formalized for yep. for usage yep. yeah yeah i go into i i say infrastructure big mm. time for me mm. and and um that's why i keep harping on on nts on on rather on kenha on the other road agencies kura kera on how we design and how we actually build the roads roads in this country are built for cars not for road users we forget that there are many road users that are not <laughs> that are not just vehicles if you just 
exit Mombasa Road here at Standard Group Center, you will not find a properly paved pedestrian walkway. The next footbridge is at General Motors. At General Motors, you'll find matatus that have queued on one lane of the road. How big is the bus stop on that? What's the design of this bus stop? What's the design of the junction and the interchange around here? I go into all those things. How many areas do we see where we have proper lanes for two-wheeled vehicles? Bikes, bicycles. Mm. If you do not have that, what are we talking about? Non-motorized transport, it's our reality that, for example, in Nairobi and other urban areas, you have non-motorized transport. You have Mokokoteni. Mm -hmm. Where are Mokokoteni people supposed to be operating from? They're not considered. Not considered at all. Mm -hmm. So when you see people behaving the way I keep complaining about this whole idea of keep left and less overtaking is an idea. It's because people are adapting to what they see on the road. If you stick to the left, you will find Moda Boda Bodas there. You will find Mkokoteni there. You will find Amatatu stopping because there is no designated bus stop between here and 20 kilometers away. And there are people who are exiting from... All these things make people behave the way they behave. When you see people overlapping because there is an accident, it is because of what they have seen and what they have experienced before. The other weekend, there was an issue here on Mombasa Road. Mm. There's a repair going on on a stretch that's less than a kilometer long, and it has taken three weeks, and there's a diversion. If a truck gets stuck on that diversion, that's the only place you are. That traffic is going to stretch for 20 kilometers or so. It happened last weekend. Mm. People were stuck on that road for three, four hours just trying to maneuver. Because of that experience, because you know you have left Nairobi, you are going to Malindi. And this is a three, four hour thing that is going to keep here over five kilometers. The next time you find an accident, you will try to get out of it as soon as you can. Because of historical Hence, experience. Hence, overlapping. Yeah. Because of historical experience. What is it? I say 90%, in my opinion, infrastructure. If we sort of infrastructure, people will behave. Like Mudeo was saying, if the road is working and the exits are clear, the markings are clear, there's road, proper road signage, you'll find you start now reducing user bad behavior. Now we start saying, okay, why are you behaving like this? Mm. Then we can ask you, okay, this, well, here you go, because then we can say, look, for the longest time we've said, okay, we're well, on lit road, so I couldn't really tell where I'm going, yeah. okay? Here on Mombasa Road, after the expressway had been completed, mm. now when you're inbound to the city, you'll find that as you then approach the exit to the southern bypass, the road is extremely uneven. Mm. If you're coming at a high speed, which you're allowed to because we're talking about a highway, that you will find yourself doing a bit of a gallop. Oh, yeah. And it's very easy if you're not um, holding on, properly that you could then swerve to the left or the right just because of the unevenness of the road number one number two the road is unmarked till road. date yep. it is unmarked yep. okay and it is required to be marked for a road of its nature now if that were to be sorted out mm. so this is a, an, an example if that were to be sorted out the road has been smoothened to the way it's supposed to be the road has been marked exits clear right now the only marking that is there is when it's telling you that you may now approach the expressway, the expressway. Mm -hmm. apart from that there is nothing else now if you gallop and you lose control you will probably cause an accident to either your left or to your right that's mm -hmm. going to happen um if that has been sorted out and the roads have been properly marked you see this your exit or you may proceed now down mombasa road yeah and you still are misbehaving mm -hmm. Then we can say, you know what? We chalk it up to you, Eric. Wait, wait, sorry, this you is... now you have problems. We're gonna put a yeah. we're gonna put a mark on your or your license or whatever. Yep. But in absence of that, you can't blame anybody. You can't say this is carelessness. No, it's you can't. not necessarily carelessness. Remove that aspect. Or what's and making then, you to yeah, be careless? Remove that aspect and then we can put it on the people. Look at Ngong Road, mm. look at Rironi, mm. the road coming in going now from um Kangemi um, and going out west. <laughs> My goodness, who are we going to blame in an instant where something happens? Or a Matatu driver decides, you know what, yeah, road, I'm not going to do this. I need to get out of here. I'm going to move uh, because the road is a mess. Yeah. Look at Ngong Road. Terrible accident that happened before that.
mm. because of an unmarked road. Fix it, and then if they still don't use it properly, blame the user. 0719-012600. What, in your opinion, is the main cause of road accidents on our roads today? Amos in Nairobi, good morning. Yes, good morning. How are you? I'm very fine. Now, uh, I would disagree with you, in as much as I agree with you to some extent, mm. I would also disagree with you because uh, we are in Kenya and we, all those problems we've talked about, yeah. we know them. Okay. We personally, as, a, as, a, as a one IG, what are we doing to ensure that we address them? What? Uh, from the experience or from the report, yeah. we always get is that most of these accidents are user, are user are human error. Uh, very minimal of them are technical errors. Now, are we, what are we doing to address these human errors? For example, most of the, the, uh, the black spots, you realize there are places where uh, the roads are very okay, they are well marked in terms of the, li uh, the yellow lines, the continuous lines and everything, but at the same, same time, these are the places where we always have a lot of accidents happening. So I think we as Kenyans also, we have an attitude which we also need to work on. We know there is a problem for sure, okay. but we are also are contributing to the problem. I think if we just do the right thing, for example, we go to a thicker road where they, always, they, they mark a speed limit to be 100 yep. kilometers per hour, yep. somebody is going at around 150. Yep. Now, overloading, uh, carrying of excess passengers, most of these accidents, at the point when they happen, you look at the vehicles, a vehicle like a, matat a Matatu, which is supposed to be carrying 14 uh, passengers, is having over 20 passengers. So in that case, who do you blame? Do you blame the roads? Do you blame the authorities? So so according the user? Amos, so according yes, to you, the problem mm -hmm. is the drivers. Both. The authorities and the drivers. Okay. But majority is now the, the drivers because most of them are human error. Majority of the accidents are human error. Okay. They think it could, could have been avoided. How do we know it's human error? Who tells us it's human error? The reports. Which reports? You realize oh, overloading, overspeeding. How, how do you... See, that is a human error. Overloading, overspeeding. Let, like, let me ask uh, you, Amos. How do they establish uh, that this accident occurred because of human error? What investigation, get, what investigation happens after an accident? It has not been done, but from the reports you always get from you, media always reporting on uh, uh, most of the time because, of course, that is also uh, a loophole from the authorities mm. because we also need that be before we address this thing into, in, into conclusion, also we need the reports from the authorities that out of the accident, uh, penetration, uh, we have them uh, like this number, yep. out of the 400, 300 has been caused by uh, maybe crossing roads uh, mm. at uh, the undesignated area. Okay. Out of this uh, uh, Matatu accident, mm. this was of a speeding, that, is what, that was human error. So we don't have a clear report on the same. Okay. But from the rumors we had from the public, <laughs> uh, or from the media, from uh, the reporters, or from the police, we, we are being told that the highest cause of accident is maybe of a speeding, overloading, and the rest. So we are assuming. Okay. That is also a loophole on, on their part. Thank but you, Amos. Thank you. In, Thank you. In all those, Thank you. Let's conclude. To, We've heard your point. Thank you. Pete in Nairobi, good morning. Good morning, Eric. How are you? I, I'd like to. I'm fine, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if, if you're if you're a motorist in this country, yes, you will know that, um, especially on the highways. And I'll not I'll not even limit myself to the to the city to the to the urban areas where you find uh, a matatu on lane three mm. uh, will at the roundabout change lane three times in front of a policeman, yeah. and and nothing happens. But when you try to do that as a private motorist you get pulled over but mm -hmm. that's that's beside the point mm -hmm. on the on the highways that are properly marked and i will take for example the one that's been on the news lately nairobi eldoret highway mm -hmm. and i'm a regular user of that road mm -hmm. and you find that on 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 continuous yellow lines on a bend matatu drivers and heavy commercial drivers and i'm talking about these long distance uh, lorries yeah it's very, very common to find a lorry overtaking another lorry around a bend where you cannot see ahead, or a matatu carrying passengers overtaking around a bend on a continuous yellow line. Now, what's the reason for all of this? Mm. Because as far as they are concerned, you know, the, it, 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 it seems it's, um, uh, it, it's a behavior, behavioral thing. Many okay. of these, if you're a motorist in this country, you know many of these people never actually went to driving schools but they have driving licenses. People start at home and driving licenses were brought to them. That's where the problem is. So NTSA should not uh, um, uh, come to the roads to blame 
the, the people that they gave licenses to without having been competent on the roads in the first place. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Pete. Rono in Eldred. Morning to you. Good morning. morning. Yeah, I come from the far left. Eh? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the whole construct is a mess. Mm -hmm. uh, our manners, our politics, uh, that informs our policies. Mm. When you look at uh, the road users, we are calling this public transport. There's nothing public about what is happening around here. Mm -hmm. There's a fellow who's been given a vehicle, given a target. You have to bring in so much money mm. at the end of the day, mm. irrespective of the condition of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a policeman on the road who is supposed to be the enforcer, Enforcer who has targets. He has to give a, a fair amount of money to whoever is, uh, is, is, is collecting from him. Mm. If we are talking about public transport, let us make it public. Let us convert all these vehicles into uh, public vehicles okay. owned by the public through an entity. Let us pay the Makasu drivers a fair mm. pay. Give them dignity in what they do. Okay. Let us have an enforcement uh, system that is devoid of uh, personal interest. Okay. Uh, before we get to <laughs> elect the next. Uh, politician and giving uh, uh, um, the mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. We, we are pl so we keep on blaming each other for, for, for no reason. Thank you, Ronald. Simon in Lesos. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. What do you think is the main cause of road accidents? Well, uh, let me talk about the drivers. Huh? Okay. Mm. It is about uh, the behavior of drivers mm -hmm. and uh, the land discipline. Mm. Now, let me use uh, the example of uh, Eldoret Nakuru Highway, okay. which is a uh, very dangerous road. Mm. Now, uh, you find drivers overtaking on a bend, which is not clear. Mm -hmm. I would blame everything on drivers, not even police officers. Mm. Although, it may contribute uh, to an extent. Uh, you find that uh, the major uh, vehicles which are causing accidents are lorries and matato PSVs. Mm. Uh, these people are not, uh, you know, they are in. They, they look like to be in hurry. Uh, secondly, mm. look at the design of, on our roads. Eh? Mm. The dwelling of Eldoret Nakuru Highway is long overdue mm. because most of the accidents are caused by the, you know, head-on collision. But when you separate, when you have dual carriage, for example, the stretch along Mau Summit and um, this place called uh, Salga, yep. when it was done dual, eh? yep. you have seen that the accidents along that stretch has reduced. Mm. I think the road CS should uh, do something on that. Okay. And also banning proboxes and voxes and CNs as for not uh, used as uh, for PSV. Eh? Mm. Mm. I don't think uh, it will save anything. Okay. Because they are not the the cause of the accident. All right. Let me talk about police officers. Let's finish on that, Simon, so we can let others also come in. Thank you for your yeah, contribution. Yeah, finally, let me, before, before I finish, eh, mm. let me talk about police officers. Uh, when you look at bribe taking, eh, mm. you find the motorist who has committed a, a felony, a, a, a problem, eh? mm. then he proceeds to give out a bribe so that he, cannot be taken to, he or she cannot be taken to court of law. So by doing so, uh, police officers are encouraging um, misbehavior in our roads. Okay. Because you know that for example, in Timbaroa, there around there, the police officers are there. I must uh, give out something. 
even if I overload. You'll get away I with it. Cannot be, you know, you point, know, uh, point made. Thank you, Simon. David in Nairobi, good morning. Good morning to you. How are you? Uh, well, I'm very fine, and you? Very, um, very I'm good. a first year listener. I'm a talent listener. Mm -hmm. Today is my first day, but I've been listening to you. My, I have some two issues. Yes. The first one, I think the biggest problem we have is the inspection department in, in, in TSA. Mm. You'll see a vehicle that uh, it has a new sticker for a whole one year, but the the vehicle, the standard, the uh, the standard of the vehicle, it's uh, it is not that standard. It is something that uh, somebody just paid some money and then uh, given the sticker. So I think the NTSA, the inspection department of NTSA, is the biggest corruption, and also they should be the one. Oh, sorry, we lost him. Peter, uh, the Motorist Association of Kenya. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Latif. Uh, so you chair the Motorist Association of Kenya, don't you? Yes, I do. Tell us, now, from your perspective as an association, what's the main cause of, our, of road accidents? Yeah, it is uh, road safety management that is lacking mm. from uh, the MTSA. Mm. Because we have standards that actually are world standards known as ISO mm. certified. And uh, these are the ones that uh, are used to have what you call continuous improvement uh, programs. Mm. This help in uh, training the driver continuously. But you will find that uh, what we are having currently is a brain game. And uh, the, crack, the ongoing crackdown is actually revenue generated. Uh, that is, uh, means that uh, the problems we are having is actually a system management of mm. safety. Okay. Yes. Okay. But also you look at uh, road design mm. is a great contributor of road accidents. Mm. All the vehicles we are buying uh, come with uh, almost the same amount of uh, import duty. Mm. But uh, the same money is not proud back to expand the roads. You can see the Nakuru uh, Naivasha Highway is very constricted. Mm -hmm. And we need that highway because it's a trunk road. You see, all the accidents that are happening mostly are on the uh, northern corridor. Yeah. And this is because we have a lot of vehicle paying a lot of taxes. In fewer alone, we are paying uh, two times. Uh, that means that for every liter you consume, half of that amount is taxes. But that money is not being proud. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, in Akuru na Naivasha, we have an existing road that uh, need only rehabilitation so that we can have a dual load. Okay. Then the inspections are no longer happening. The inspection of vehicles are no longer happening. And what do you mean? And yeah, Inspection it's no longer, is no longer happening? Where? It, it is no longer happening. What happens is that you pay, uh, people pay money and they get the sticker. Ah, okay. The, if you go to Rikoni, there is no inspection that happens. Actually, even uh, the current crackdown is cruelest. Mm. And targeting centers and pro boxes which serve inside. Actually, during, I think it was uh, Kenyatta era when uh, some people tried to fight smaller uh, vehicles doing uh, public transport in the interior. Because these centers and pro uh, serve where the bigger matatu uh, uh, does not serve. Mm. Will not go. So uh, when we ban these hardworking Kenyans, and yet there are no jobs and we want to stop that problem instead of regulating it. Mm. That is where uh, we have the problem. Thank so you, we Peter. have serious issues, but we are never in, uh, mostly we need uh, also motorists to be involved in uh, uh, policy making so that uh, this uh, manners of road accidents can be addressed. Thank okay. you, Latif. Asante sana. Before we take a break, let's hear from Jimmy, who is calling us from the UAE. Jimmy, hello. Hi, good morning, Latif. How are you? And do, yeah, good. good. Good morning, Jimmy. Yeah, hi. Uh, now I just wanted to contribute in this debate. Mm. I've asked you several times, several times, how much is enough? <laughs> Who knows, man? <laughs> yeah, in, in Kenya we lack rule of law. Okay. Infrastructural design. Mm. Yeah, and uh, we we only inspect we only inspect uh, the public service vehicles. Mm. 
In UAE, even at 2024, Lexus 570 mm. is inspected mm. every year. Mm. Because now you inspect a part of the motorist, uh, a part of the vehicles, and the others you don't inspect. Again, culture change okay. and etiquette. Mm. We lack it. Uh, just the other day, I was carrying uh, my friend who is a senior government official, and mm. he was like, he was like, he saw a motorbike stopping behind a motorist in a traffic light, <laughs> and he was like. What is it? <laughs> and I was like, he was expecting the motor, the, the motorbike to drive on. Yeah. Until until to the to the to the zebra crossing. Mm. But I told him there's rule of law here. Okay. Yeah. Once once you guys invest heavily on rule of law, which is very painful. It yeah. Will change. Like Mich 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 Michuki Michuki tried his bit. But Tiangi also tried his bit to have the, all the um, school buses painted yellow. Right? Yep. It is very painful. And again, and again, uh, the, the number of vehicles are growing every day. Mm. Do we have in, any infrastructural changes? No. Not commensurate. Jimmy, thank you very much. Thank you for the call. Yeah. Have a lovely Haribu. day in the UAE. Have a lovely day too. Thank you. Cheers. Asante. Let's take this break 25 minutes to 9. Kenya's biggest conversation. Sunny, sunny conditions, partly sunny conditions and cloudy mostly in Nairobi at 18. We'll see highs of 27 and lows of 16. It's mostly cloudy at 19 in Nakuru, highs of 27 and we'll see highs no of 27 in a mostly cloudy area. area at 19. It's 17 and partly sunny in Eldoret with highs of 25 and looking into a sunny Kisumu at 29, we'll see highs of 33. Malindi will go to highs of 33 in a mostly cloudy morning at 30. And we're looking into cloudy conditions at 23 in Kisumu and partly sunny at 22 in Kakamega. Kampala is sunny at 23 and Dar es Salaam is sunny at 28 going to highs of 32 and looking into a sunny Johannesburg at 10 degrees we'll see highs of 20 um, Mogadishu is sunny at 30 while Addis Ababa at 18 is sunny mostly cloudy conditions in Lagos at 28 and at 25 Kinshasa is mostly sunny Life. Land is road heavy as you go towards the city center this morning. Um, it's also uh, pretty heavy coming in from that area of um, Kamkunji and then touching on Ring Road, Ngara. Uh, also on Gong Road, a little bit of traffic was heading out towards community and then we're looking at some of it still on Limu Road. But today has not been a terribly uh, busy traffic day, but we're still keeping an eye on things. Um, Langata Road was busy as you get towards the um, Nyao Stadium roundabout. Just a little bit of that left as you touch on Uhuru Highway. We'll see you in a bit. Uh, let's talk on Spice FM KE on X hashtag The Situation Room. some very nice mature music. It really took me back to my days and I can just feel young again and enjoy the vibes. Spice. I'm a good listener of Spice FM. You played the best music. This is 94.4 Spice FM. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Yeah. 
Mornings done right. Room this morning, our guest has arrived. He is a Titus Lotte. Titus is the honourable member for Kachaliba constituency. He's our guest. Good morning, Mishmua. Good morning. How are you? I'm very good. Welcome to the hot seat of the situation. Room. Thank you. Karibu sana. Yeah. First, I have a message for you from ICE Lion. And they say, you know what? Eh? When Mishmua comes, tell him he speaks to many people, but also he has plans. And they say, whatever the plan you have, okay? I see a lion have experience. They've been here for 60 years and they have been working with people when it comes to insurance, when it comes to wealth management and all and planning. And it's important that they, that you talk to people who have know-how and proper knowledge. And uh, what they do is then they walk you through your plan. They advise you the best way to actualize your plan. And then you come up with a product that suits you. So your product, and my product will be different all under ICA Lion mm. being advised by the same person but each one of us has a different plan whatever plan you have so email plan.icelion.co.ke or you can go to their website plan.icelion.co.ke and you get a lot of information from them you'll find a chatbot there which is very active ask a question they respond immediately so Moshmua City Muga is not in today but uh, he has given me the proverbs and to share with you good today the proverb is from the kingdom of morocco and today's proverb says if you have to beg beg the rich people if you have to beg beg the rich people what's your interpretation of this proverb oh well i agree i totally agree with that proverb because if you look at the bible jesus said uh, you knock, knock, and finally the door will be open. And actually, if you continue with that kind of reading, they'll tell you there was a lady who was poor, and she went to a judge who was rich and continued knocking until the judge said, uh, let me give her uh, what she wants, because if I don't, then she'll continue disturbing me. So mm. it basically is true that uh, it's the rich people that can be able to give you, because if you go to a poor person, even if they, worth, they, they, they have the will to give you, they have nothing to give you so i think the proverb is okay from the kingdom of morocco mm. you said so mm. and i appreciate that uh, at least there are people that can be able to from the islamic world be able to resonate with the bible says. Mm. great mm. <laughs> i'm sure they will i'm sure many people will resonate with this particular proverb um as a member of parliament you every member of parliament must belong to at least one committee sure and a lot of business of parliament especially in the national assembly happens in the committees sure in which committee do you belong well i belong to two committees mm -hmm. uh, i think the main committee is uh, environment forestry and mining mm -hmm. and then i also belong to another committee called the diaspora workers mm -hmm. um basically we are trying to in this committee we're trying to ensure that all the diaspora and especially those that are in uae mm. uae are actually taken care of because we know what has actually been all these years we've actually heard of very sad tales and stories coming from the uae mm. uh, so we're trying it's the first time this committee is established as a new committee mm. uh, but then uh, the main committee that i belong is the environment and we can actually see that our environment is really beaten mm. we predict whether the weather is predicted today the weatherman is saying it's going to rain for the next six months and then in two weeks we find that there are no rains across yeah. this country mm. so we are also trying to be abreast with what is happening across the globe uh, to ensure that uh, Kenyans are not left behind. Mm. One of the things that we've talked about many times here is um, we know the business of the House happens in committees, and this is where committees then are able to, when it comes to oversighting the executive or the various agencies of the executive, it happens in committees. When it comes to investigating things that could have to come to the public domain, there are things that may not be going right in government, mm. committees will then do this. There's someone, and you have powers to summon anybody in the Republic of Kenya to come and respond to questions that you may have as parliament. But also we say that this is where we see a lot of monkey business taking place. So there's a lot of, you know, pomp and color as a committee is conducting an investigation. And then you see the report of that committee and you wonder what on earth was all, mm. that all about. When it goes now to the plenary of, the, of, of parliament, it's either shut down or nothing much comes out of it. Your committee, are you involved in any current investigation or matters that you're seeking to get a deeper understanding from the executive? Sure. 
Uh, sure. First of all, I want to make it clear mm. that um, well, what you've said is correct, but not in every committee. Mm. Um, most of the things, uh, most of the times, the committees are conducting business. It's actually a parliamentary uh, business, so it is recorded in the answered. So any Kenyan can be able to access this. And every time there is a committee uh, proceeding, you are allowed as a Kenyan to participate in this committee mm. and as a Kenyan you are also allowed to petition a committee to investigate a matter so and we've seen this uh, taking place in this country mm. uh, what I can actually say is that um, well um, there are also monkey businesses I cannot reject I am not living in a different country I'm living in Kenya there are monkey businesses where uh, you know if uh, an investigation takes place even from an audit for the auditor general reports finally find itself in the house it finds itself in the committee and the committee is supposed to investigate and the committee is supposed to make recommendations mm. uh, so sometimes you, you know how kenyans operate uh, immediately a matter is coming up uh, the the people affected will try to talk to the auditor general and if the auditor general cannot be able to erase that matter mm. and then it escalates up like that it come it comes finally to the house mm. and when it comes to the house then they they want to rescue themselves from there and if it goes through that it goes to the courts mm. they want to bribe the judge so I, i'll tell you kenyans are very ingenious in terms of trying to get themselves out of issues mm. uh, so sometimes they do get themselves out from the auditor general there mm -hmm. are things that happens and the auditor general and the team will be able to get it out because these people are able to talk to them if they, they don't do it at that level then it goes to another level it goes to parliament sometimes it gets out from there sometimes it goes beyond that and parliament recommends prosecution mm. and it goes to courts and you find at the prosecutor level then it can disappear or sometimes it goes all that full, full hearing mm. and even at the level of full hearing the judges somehow can be <laughs> compromised and uh, so sometimes all the sieves mm. all the three sieves four sieves five sieves before somebody is convicted people will always try to get a way out so yep. it parliament mm. just like any other institutions you find some monkey businesses but not all the time uh, the other question you asked is about what we're doing currently in our committee mm. in one of the investigation that we're currently taking place is the African climate summit you know we had a climate summit last year in November yes mm -hmm. where 25 presidents came yes uh, the, the whole Africa was here. actually the whole world was here mm. we try to talk about matters climate and there were a lot of money that were poured in four billion shillings mm -hmm. from donors came in from for what uh, for, for the fu for for the function for, for the summit you four know the billion summit. shillings for bill around four billion shillings what for the, the two days of the summit uh for the four days four, uh, days. Three, four days of the summit okay one day was registration uh, one, yeah of course closing. yeah and then of course we we actually have to one day and one day yes yeah four billion shillings we are investigating that matter i you actually saw that in the newspapers so, um a month ago mm. where we really asked the cabinet secretary and the ps responsible and all people responsible mm. to come and tell us how were these monies how were, first of all were this money coming mm. how from what sources mm. and what were the interests of those people who actually brought in monies mm. and how have this money has been expended mm. because uh four billion shillings uh, um there's a lot of money to be expended it in is. four days mm. uh, basically it basically tells you that we are spending 1000 million shillings per day that is like a billion shillings per day mm. so we are on behalf of kenyans trying to get to the bottom of the matter so when we ask these people to come the responsible people to come including mm. price waterhouse that was managing this fund mm. uh, they were not able to give us the details that we wanted they will give us breakdowns that are actually not legit if they tell you that the head of state that came spent 98 million fine uh, the people that came in from kenya spent 100 to 200 million fine who are these kenyans and how are they facilitated mm -hmm. the media was also there and i think you also accused mm -hmm. media houses not you mm -hmm. or spies but probably media houses uh, to have taken like 100 200 million shillings for the two days i don't know what <coughs> that will entail mm. so basically we're still in that investigation mm. they have come to our committee twice mm. we've asked them to give us a legit comprehensive report which we expect that report to come out in the next two months mm -hmm. uh in two months if we do not get that report then we will escalate it up and i'll tell you i'm saying this in spice we say this uh, it was in live coverage uh, we as a committee we're not going to compromise if they tell us how they spend the money and it's legit then we'll tell Kenyans of course four billion shillings was expended uh, very well the African climate summit was good but if we find that there are gaps if we find that there are exp explanations that cannot be met mm. then we'll tell Kenyans so mm, what yeah. made you what made you start this investigation um, so what made us start this investigation is Kenyans because 
Kenyans want to know. Kenyans mm -hmm. are a very inquisitive lot. They will always want to know about everything. So even us being members of parliament on behalf of Kenyans, there are those who are selling us. Now, well, the government said we did not spend a single dime mm. of public coffers on this. Mm -hmm. So then that brought up the matter. Well, who's funded it? And so the investigation started. Who funded it? And then we found all those people who funded it. And again, this is something that we as Africans we've suffered from. Mm. A lot of people fund NGOs, a lot of people find institutions because they have got interest. So we wanted to know, is it an interest that the climate summit was done on behalf of, Af of Kenyans and on behalf of Africans or was it done on behalf of the funders? So we all were investigating who are these funders and what, what was their interest. Mm. Because after that, there were a lot of pledges, a lot of pledges that came from donors, a lot of pledges that came from the UN, a lot of pledges that came from other institutions. Yeah. We're trying to get what was the outcome. We have not so far seen the pledges, the billions of shillings that we will have actually gotten out of the climate summit. So we're trying to say, was it just a public show or was it uh, something that goes beyond that? So first, first of all, we, we, we want to investigate to know mm -hmm. um, the motive of the funding, the source of the funding and the expenditure of this funding. Who have you summoned so far? Uh, we've summoned the peers the PS that was responsible, and the whole entire team. You know, there was a secretariat there that was, was set up. For, yes. The secretariat has been summoned. Mm -hmm. uh, Pricewaterhouse Coopers, which was the fund manager, was also summoned. Mm -hmm. So we have summoned the entire team that actually managed the whole thing. Uh, we are yet to summon the, power, the cabinet secretary, because if this team is not able to satisfy the committee, then mm -hmm. the committee will have to escalate it up and get it the, 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 the cabinet secretary. And mm -hmm. if, it, if it doesn't, then probably we might even petition the president to come and tell us because the president played a very key role in ensuring that this thing is played in Kenya. Yeah. yeah. I'm concerned about uh, um, why is the interest around this specifically? And uh, we've seen Auditor General control of budget, people who are tasked with raising queries about much more money that is unexplained throughout the economy for years and why there hasn't been this kind of a, you know, activity around having those explained. What is different about this particular climate summit and the four billion shillings? Uh, well, uh, one of the thing about this climate summit is because globally we are actually going through what we all know the climate change mm -hmm. and there's a lot of interest in this and um we have to get it right as a country mm. and the fact that we were given the privilege of holding and hosting those things mm. uh, it gives us the opportunity to be able to make it right mm. so that um, probably we become global leaders later if we get it right and that we get right if you get it wrong that we will definitely be in the bad books of the world yeah so uh, that is the first concern that uh, as a committee, then we will need to let Kenyans know. It's the first thing that has ever happened. We've never had such a big forum in this country mm. like that. Mm. So we need to get it right that Kenyans were able to do it. They got the, they got the funding, they got the expenditure, they got it right, and that the pledges that came then were able to come and support the climate in this globe. Yeah. Mm. Two, uh, you know, the Auditor General specifically looks more on the funding that comes from the exchequer and those that come from the donor into the public coffers. Mm. But this one was a specific fund that is not, doesn't go to the public coffers. It, at, it is a fund that goes to a secretariat, to a secretariat, uh -huh. the Climate Summit Secretariat that was managing it. Okay. So we are also raising it so that the Auditor General, if we cannot be able to satisfy it, then the Auditor General can take it because at the end of it all, even if it went to the secretariat, yeah. it didn't go to the the summation of the funding that comes into this country. Yeah. So the Auditor General can be able to pick it up because at the end of it all, whether it came to the consolidated fund mm. or it wasn't, it is still money that was expended mm. by public institutions in this country. Do you smell a rat? I mean, um, for somebody, for you to then have the conversation, I mean, last, you talked about, you know, going to actually sit down. Is there something that doesn't sit well that would then say, well, you know what, then we need to ask questions. It doesn't uh, uh, quite well, sound right. Well, at this point, I cannot say that I smell a rat, mm. but uh, the, the magnitude of the expenditure within the very short time, mm. then 
uh, raises the queries mm. the mm. anybody can like if you've been spending if you've been spending 100 shillings per day and then within a day then you start spending 10,000 shillings then you have to ask yourself what is it that has made me spend 10,000 when I've actually been spending a, a hundred shillings sure. so basically that is the question I cannot at this point say that I smell a rat mm. until when we get the explanations if the explanation will be legit mm. and then we can be able to clap and say yeah we have got the capacity to spend that big of that big lot. money yeah. Yeah. but is it four billion shillings for only the four days of the summit or does it also include the build-up to the summit uh well it includes the build-up to the summit okay and how long is the build -up? um the build-up to the summit i think we started three months too and uh, we were supposed to wind up this thing in january mm. uh we've again pushed it to to march and again we were still pushing it up again so we even that we are also questioning so it goes into maybe about six to nine months six to nine months of, of but um where the expenditure was where the spike of the expenditure was was during the four two days mm. uh, the, the other was is just running the secretariat getting the reports which is normally uh, something that will not probably even cost you probably 100 million mm. because one the institution that is called the secretariat is been housed housed by well wishes so yeah. they're not even paying rent mm. they are the 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 vehicles they're using or the equipments they're using are probably paid for by well wishes mm. so we are trying to investigate at the time of the expenditure yeah i am 100 percent sure this will not the other build up or even aftermath will not take like 100 million mm. and yet we're talking about four billion so we're probably saying probably because of the four three four days that is where we expended close to 90% of this funding mm. and that's what we're looking at okay yeah so how what point does a committee such as yours start and end an investigation about expenditure of public funds and when where does the public accounts committee come in on the expenditure of public funds um, immediately our, our point our point is uh, the point where we start is uh, at the point of uh, 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 this item being raised by the members of public or mm. even within the committees. Mm -hmm. so the committee can say, well, within our own purview, we find that there's a matter here that we need to, to look at. Mm -hmm. Or a member of public can petition a member of the committee or the committee itself mm. to say, please, can you, on behalf of ourselves, get to investigate this? And I think this is one of them. So we can then start to look through and see mm. what is it uh, that is after we're finished then we can be able to take our reports up all the way to the main house okay. uh, yeah and then from the main house then you can be taken from there mm. the public account committee is also equally given the task to look at it mm. at any time because even them they they have to look through all the committees all the reports all the anything to deal with our accounts mm. in this country so i cannot say that there is a delimitation of where the public accounts committee comes in and where the committee itself mm. uh, of the particular matter comes in it is a matter of who picks it first mm. uh, just like the dci and the escc yeah. so sometimes you find there's a matter that goes to escc and that matter probably will have been prosecuted by the dci or mm. there's a matter that is done by the dci and then we find the concurrently being looked at by the escc mm. so uh, both both of them are actually committees that are supposed to bring up this matter so if ESCC probably comes up with the prosecution because of a matter uh, DCI will be happy at least some work has been done or if, if the opposite happens despite the fact that if you look at their mandates they're a little bit different yeah but um, all of it can lead to prosecution because at the end of it all we are we, we are all trying to for the, to work for the good of this country so uh, between the public account committee and any committee it is who starts first but mm. I think it is the purview of the committee to be able to be very critical in terms of looking at it because the committee mandate is specific public account committee looks at anything money mm. across board yeah so so how far down the road are you with this investigation when should we expect to get a report out of this committee on this particular matter uh well i said we've given them time and mm. um probably in the next two months I'd, i said that earlier so that they can give us the report if they give us a legit report then kept, the public will still get to know mm. if they don't then the public will still get to know mm. yeah so that is all that we're doing are you also investigating the outcomes of the conference yeah we are the reason why i say that there were a lot of pledges you mm. remember when the when the conference was being closed there were a lot of pledges from across the globe mm -hmm. yeah. people say we are pledging billions actually there was around 500 billion of dollars paid mm. for various activities we are also trying to 
on behalf of Kenyans. Where is it? Because after the public pronouncements, then who tells Kenyans what have come? Was yes. that money pledged to Kenya or was that Globally. money pledged Globally. to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was, it was pledged to the climate action agenda yes. Yes. for several things, for several countries to then and they are domicile. Those, and there are those that will definitely come to Kenya. Okay. So we are specifically then looking at... What was uh, pledged for Kenya? What was pledged what globally? what will come to Kenya? What, what will, first of all, was pledged globally because it was pledged from Nairobi. Okay. And so it is us to look at it so mm. that we can also be able to report to the globe and say, listen, this is what was pledged and this is what we've gotten. Then specifically now we center to Kenya mm. because that is where our interest is. What is it for Kenyans? What has come for Kenyans? So yeah. as much as we report globally and say, okay, fine, out of the $500 billion, we've gotten $400 billion, it goes to this and this. And then we specifically come to Kenya because the committee needs to see that the actions that are supposed to be in Kenya are actually implemented in Kenya. Okay. Yeah. As we conclude, one of the things that also ha ha came out of that, co uh, that summit plus other climate conversations is carbon trading. And carbon trading is now becoming a big thing in this country. Is the committee technically aware of carbon trading and how what's happening in the country? Yeah, the committee is technically aware. In fact, um, as we speak, we last week we were with the same committee last week because a lot of Kenyans don't understand what carbon trading is. It's a new term. Mm. And uh, people don't even think it has anything to go but you find the president is very specific about it. Mm. We have laws that are actually within the, the, the floor of the house on how we're going to share the revenues that are coming from carbon trading. And the public were invited and people have given their notice. Mm. But I think what we can say about this is uh, this week, uh, things starting today in EMBO, mm. the, the ministry is actually putting up together people to be trained on carbon trading because a lot of people don't understand. So yep. as a committee, we are ensuring that the Kenyans are also made to be aware about what carbon trading is so that mm. people are not duped in there. Mm. Mm. Mushmua, thank you for joining us today. Come again soon. We continue this conversation. There's a lot of awareness that needs to be created on matters of environment and then also how to reach out to the committee and to petition the committee. Asante. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I am even perplexed that you are so knowledgeable about this. I thought. <laughs> 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 yeah. Titus Lotte yeah, is you. the member of parliament for Kachariba constituency. He's been our guest. Keep it here for more 9 a.m. news time. The most are the Rift Valley, northeastern, including Marsabit, Mandera, Wajia, and Isiolo, and in Nyando area, Homa Bay County. More than 300 families have been left homeless due to the floods. In addition, in the western region, residents of Budalangi have been advised to move to safer areas due to the possibility of floods and landslides. Koto Secretary General Francis Atoll is optimistic that as a new leader, Rhino Dinga will clinch the African Union Commission chairmanship position due to the efforts by President William Ruto to promote him. Atoll has praised the President's efforts to support and even promote Rilo Dinga despite having different political views. Speaking on Citizen TV, Atoli has however said that if Rilo does not win the victory, he still has the position of political leadership in the country. Police at Malaba Station in Teso North Busia County have intercepted 18 kgs of bang and 10 liters of changa which were being ferried to Kayole in Nairobi from Uganda. The operation also saw three people arrested as detectives confiscated the drugs. Confirming the incident, Teso North OCPD Joseph Martiku said they were tipped off by members of the public regarding the trio who looked suspicious. The three who included an elderly woman said to be the mastermind of the deal and two middle-aged men are found in possession of the substances and are helping the police with further investigations. Police in Gabon say a crime wave has hit the capital Libreville several days after the country's transitional president pardoned and set free over 500 prisoners. Civil society groups have since launched a campaign asking the government to give the former prisoners more support and for freed prisoners to be law-abiding citizens. General Jean Jamin Efiaong Onong, commander-in-chief of Gabon's penitentiary administration, said that former prisoners caught committing crimes will either be punished or sent back to prison. Onong said the country's transitional government, led by General Bryce Clotaire Oligui Nguema, wants civilians to live in peace with total freedom to carry out their daily activities.
And U.S. President Joe Biden has said that he does not agree with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's approach to Israel's war against the Hamas militant group and that Israel should call for a halt in fighting to facilitate humanitarian aid deliveries. The Spanish language network Univision interviewed Biden on April 3rd, two days after an Israeli attack killed seven staff members from the aid group World Central Kitchen in Gaza. Biden said there is no excuse for not providing food and medicine medical aid to the people of Gaza and that those efforts should be done now. President Xi Jinping now says that Beijing is ready to ramp up bilateral communication with Moscow, boost multilateral strategic cooperation and step up solidarity among countries of the global south. He made the remarks during a meeting with visiting Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov at the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. Lavrov arrived in Beijing on a two-day official visit. C said he and Russian President Vladimir Putin have agreed to continue maintaining close contact to ensure that the relations between the two countries constantly move forward in a smooth and stable manner. He stressed that Beijing supports the Russian people in taking their own path of development that is in line with their national conditions and it supports Moscow in combating terrorism and maintaining security and stability. This is Newswire. I'm Dennis Aceto. Good morning. Four point four Spice FM, Nairobi. Okay. Um, traffic still a little bit here and there in the city. We're looking at some of that just coming um, off of Langata Road and touching on Uhuru Highway just a little bit on Jagur Road. There's some traffic also getting into the city. And looking at that um, Kamkunji Roundabout, Landis Road also then getting into the CBD. That's about the size of it. A little bit on Uhuru Highway here and there. And on the thicker Super Highway, um, that's mostly clear. Kiamburo just joined the party with some traffic, then getting towards Muthaiga Square. Let's see what happens as we go through towards the end of traffic hour. We'll talk on Spice FM KE on X hashtag The Situation Room. Good morning, and I love your show. Thank you. Thank you. Having come from a Kikuyu radio background, I migrated to Spice <laughs> because of the content. I was born in a slum, but somehow I got a break in life. So sometimes when you see the sweating coming out because of the passion and whatever it is, <laughs> <laughs> behind the noise, there are people, and we share the same umbilical cord. It shouldn't be like that. I am so disappointed. We used to tell Honda uh, Baraila Molotinga that he's doing police of conmanship. And even President Uhuru Kenyatta, Srikali, he is going to conmanship the earlier you. You cannot promise people that you reduce tax, then you double. In politics, mm. there is uh, the issue of trust. Mm. For you to turn around and then stab the same people who gave you that trust, there is no other level of dishonesty. And I mabo, utaona dunia tu. The situation. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the it's Situation Room, the Africa. only way to start yes. your day. The Met Department has warned, be careful, because in this current rains, what you're going to see is especially areas around the Lake Nyanza Basin, the Nyanza Lake Basin, you're going to see a lot of water. The rivers will overflow. Mm. This will invariably lead to what? 
to the displacement of people. Yes, it will. Page 10 of the standard today is talking about that. Several counties are on the edge as floods wreak havoc, leading to loss of lives and displacement of people. This is happening as heavy rains continue to pound parts of the country. In Narok, four family members died following a landslide at Ololunga after a night of heavy rains. Hundreds were displaced in Kisumu and West Pokot counties. The developments are bound to test the preparedness of counties to handle emergencies after similar floods last year left a trail of destruction and loss of lives. Yesterday, resilience or residents rather of Ololunga village were still struggling to come to terms with the loss of members of one family. Narok South, South Sub County Deputy Co County Commissioner Felix Kisalu said the mass slide occurred at night following heavy rains experienced in the area. Kisalu led a team of disaster management to the scene where the bodies were retrieved and they were moved to the Narok County morgue. Uh, th this is happening countrywide. Indeed. Yes, it is. And um, just from all indications of what we've seen, that this is going to continue. Mm -hmm. um, the call is to ask that as much can be done. In terms of preparedness, preparedness by nature of definition means that you would have done it prior to the incident. Mm -hmm. But in this case, now we're looking <laughs> at mitigation, aren't we? Yep. Um, and can we fault and say that we didn't prepare? Yes, we can. Because did we receive early warnings? Yes, we did. The weatherman talked about severe rain and sent out a warning, the first of which came in December, mm. just looking at some notes. Mm. And then another one came in February, in, uh, end of January to the first week of February mm. to tell us that rains would come in April and last until June and that they would be heavy in nature and that there would be the possibility of the things that we are seeing today. Mm. So... Early warning systems are in place. Yep. Preparedness for such things, not so much. Let's find out. We have invited and he's joined us. The Secretary General of the Kenya Red Cross Society, Dr. Idris Ahmed, is our guest. Good morning, Dr. Ari. Good morning. Good to have you here. Thank you. Welcome to the hot seat of the Situation Room. Thank you. There's a lot that the Kenya Red Cross has been doing over the very many years on this particular matter, on floods, on various emergencies and disasters in the country. And we just want to understand, from your perspective, how we are doing as a country in terms of preparedness, in terms of mitigation, in terms of communication, in terms of response, in all matters. But I want to first welcome you with the day's proverb. Um, I'm doing this on behalf of our colleague Siti Muga, who's away today. But he had done the research and told me the proverbs for this week are from the Kingdom of Morocco. And today's proverb specifically, and I want you to listen and give us your interpretation of it. If you have to beg, beg the rich people. If you have to beg, beg the rich people. <laughs> What's your interpretation of this problem? That's a difficult one. Mm. <laughs> because the only person that you beg is someone who has more than you. So will it not be factual? Look, I think the understanding is uh, we, in terms of association, you mm. need to associate with people who are better than you in terms of skill sets. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and, and the idea is that if it is learning adding value, value will added by someone who has more than you. And not necessarily in terms of wealth, uh, because begging... Or t most of the time the risk is interpreted from a wealth perspective yes. or a money perspective. Yes. I, th I think the idea is being more strategic around the people who you interact with, the people who you rely on, and yeah, just get a person who is better than you are. That's a very good one. Mm. Establish a social network right. that builds you. That's a very good one. Very good way of looking at it. Asante. Now, Kenya Red Cross, yeah. every time we see anything matter of disaster we expect and we actually end up seeing red cross officials on the ground you have handled many things you've handled fires you've handled, handled emergencies you've handled medical emergencies accidents uh, and now floods let's talk about the current situation the short rains of october november december is, it, uh, is that what they are yeah yep we saw the flooding that happened particularly in the northern parts of the country and along the coast now again we are seeing a new fresh uh, wave of heavy rain floods displacement mm. are we prepared why are we prepared for what we are seeing now yes i think maybe let's uh, understand the context and then we can get to answer the question of whether we're prepared mm. so the rains for october november december rainfall were you know above normal rainfall meaning that not really normal and that's what we 
had the long debate of El Nino, no El Nino. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that from that time we understood that the October, November, December rainfall one will last longer than expected. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the period, how long uh, we will be receiving, it will be longer than expected. Mm -hmm. And so the cumulative interpretation of that forecast was that there will be a connection between the October, November, December rainfall and the March, April, May rainfall, the mm -hmm. short rains and the long rains. Mm -hmm. There will be very little period for recovery. And, and so that's what now we've witnessed. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had, uh, we've barely had a period of dryness in the country. I think uh, last night I mentioned um, that it's just a few weeks ago that the population who were displaced from the previous uh, rain season, October, November, December rainfall, just went back to their homes. Mm -hmm. And now they're preparing to get back to, to displacement. So uh, the season, this particular connection of these two seasons is unique mm -hmm. because of the El Nino phenomena. Mm. Uh, so are we generally, I think, uh, prepared? Look, I, I, we have come a long way in terms of our early warning system. And by the way, your last comment was spot on. Mm. Uh, the Kenya Met Department capacity to, 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 to do the forecasting has improved mm. dramatically over the last period, you know, number of years. And so we're getting information, early warning information on time, mm. uh, spot on, mm -hmm. uh, on most of the occasions. Uh, even with this particular season, by the way, the March, April, May season is a difficult season to forecast uh, so you don't have a huge lead time to understand the exact impact compared to the October November December rainfall but we got good information early enough because of the El Nino phenomena as you said now where our weakness is is how to link the early warning uh, information with the response uh, system the preparedness system mm -hmm. uh, so and uh, second, also to answer uh, the question of are we prepared, even that we've come a long way in preparedness as a country. Uh, I remember when I started my career, it was extremely difficult for the country to preposition uh, material equipment. Mm -hmm. These days it's becoming more common to preposition equipment, to preposition supplies that are needed. But the scale uh, of the impact, I don't think we can be prepared enough. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, uh, Eric, the infrastructure destroyed from the last season, we've not had enough time to repair and recover. Mm. And now we're dealing with a context uh, in which the rainfall, the effects are being felt in a system that has already been destroyed yeah. um, uh, by the last uh, r rainfall season, which now brings me to the main point that affects our preparedness. We're living in a context in which uh, the risks that we are facing have become so systemic, overlapping each other, mm. and each risk affecting the capacity to deal with the upcoming risk. So as a country, generally, our vulnerability has increased uh, huge because of successive disasters, moving from drought to floods and mm. floods to drought, and that cyclical nature of uh, emergencies. Mm. Okay. Can we see, I mean, you've talked about improvement when it comes to um, early warning systems, and we've seen that. I think that we, we saw that there was a prediction of El Nino. Uh, we saw that there was a prediction of, you know, heavier than usual rainfall, and then that what would happen as a result of that. Um, you talk about an improvement in preparedness as well. You know, I, we did see that there was, um, especially from the Red Cross, that then there was talk of what to do um, in certain areas. In Kenya, where we deal with several different governments, and I'm going to talk about the county system here, mm. whereby there are certain counties or there are certain areas that are more prone to um, what would be disasters as a result of where they are situated geographically, right? Mm. Have we been able to make a link between what we know and i'm going to call what the weatherman says will happen mm. and what ought to happen to protect people and livelihoods have mm. we seen that that has been connected i think there's a major weakness in that one mm. uh, so let's start with a constitutional uh, problem mm. so disaster management in the country is a shared responsibility between the national government and the county government mm. means there need to be a high level of coordination between the two levels of yeah. government yeah. and the major weakness we've had in terms of that coordination is lack of an effective legislation around disaster risk management so yeah. that that has been a major weakness in terms of uh, uh, you know unpacking the constitutional structure
infrastructure for risk management, disaster risk management. There is a process that has been started now. There is a bill in Parliament. I think it's gone through the second reading. So we hope once that passes, then there will be a solution in terms of ability to coordinate between the two levels of government and all other actors. So that's the first point. Mm. The second one is we've been very weak in linking our disaster risk management strategies with the long-term development planning for the country. Mm. And I think the major uh, challenges that we have in terms of risk management, disaster risk management, are developmental in nature. So mm. unless we get uh, that clarity in linkage between our development planning and the risk management architecture, then we'll always be playing a catch-up game. And that's mm. the reality of what is happening. Mm. And then the third level of weakness, I think, is now operational in nature, linking between budget allocations on an annual basis at the county level, at the national level, with the risk management strategy. So mm. we don't have sufficient resources that are available for disaster risk management uh, as a country. But in any event, I think that that is part of a bigger problem that the 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 level of resources that are going to development in the country is you know really really small since we have a huge uh, recurrent expenditure so what is the impact of these three facts mm. uh, that uh, in 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 a number of ways it leaves a lot of room for improvement on what we can do as a country in terms of better preparedness uh, better planning for our response and actually better response to to the emergencies yeah. mm. but then we know we know where our weaknesses are. And we've known this for very many years. Something as simple as having that harmonized legislation that creates a harmonized response structure between the two levels of government, why don't we have that in place? Even before devolution, there was an attempt at having the National Disaster Management Authority or something of, yeah. of that sort established. Yeah. Yeah. That thing just died. Yeah. Why? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think hi historically this is something we got wrong. Mm. Uh, the first time we published as a country the disaster management policy was in 1998 after the bomb blast. Uh, mm. And since then we've taken, we took a very long time to adopt that into policy. Mm. And now, you know, by the way, to be honest, it baffles many of us on why it hasn't happened. Because the goodwill has been there, the discussion is there, there's really every emergency we have we have uh, we, we know we, we we reflect on it we say we have a major weakness we'll find a solution but it just hasn't happened mm. I'm more optimistic now to be honest mm. uh, because one the policy has been adopted uh, mm. so it's uh, in place mm -hmm. the legislation has been drafted is going through the, the readings uh, mm -hmm. so the question to the answer why have we not done this for you know over the many years there are many possible responses but just that we've missed it as a country Country. Uh, mm. And by the way, a country like South Africa learned from our draft policy that we took in 1998, adopted the legislation, amended several times, have a strengthened uh, system. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's something that historically is a blot, by the way, in our in, I mean, in sure, our history. And, and, and something, as, in, in my opinion, as simple as having an authority established to then deal with disaster management then seems to be... A teeth pulling exercise yeah yeah, yeah. We, we we got this one wrong mm. we got this one wrong but there's something about saying we got this wrong yeah. Chris. you know if we don't understand why we haven't been able to do what we all clearly know we ought to be doing mm. what well, we have seen others coming and borrowing from our brains and going and running with it and it works if we don't understand why if we don't become completely um, honest with this conversation about why we haven't done it then even what we are doing now will not succeed. We have to actually sit back and reflect and ask ourselves, why? Is it because of commercial interest somewhere? Is it because of political interest somewhere? Because there has to be something. You're an expert on identifying risk. This is a risk to the implementation of what you're saying now mm. is hopeful. Mm. Yeah, you, you, you have the uh, huge point, by the way, Eric. Good point to the wrong person. Um, <laughs> the, the reason why I say to the wrong person yeah. is I, I am not speaking on behalf of government, of uh, but are. I speak on, uh, you know, uh, authoritatively as someone who has been within these circles for a number of years. Mm. Uh, when I tell you we got it wrong, it is an acceptance that uh, at the end of the day, this should not have been the case. Yes. Uh, now, to point uh, at the exact problem on why 
we didn't adopt which is you know as you say it baffles you um, you know baffles all of us why it hasn't happened i can't actually point at any real 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 reason why it shouldn't have been it shouldn't have been done other than the fact that at the end of the day when we look historically we just accept that we missed opportunities it came with cost mm -hmm. and in the future this is something that we can really really avoid so let's uh, now um, get to the idea the point that you've made those reasons if we do not analyze if we don't find a solution to it in depth then it will affect any process in the future of even uh, strengthening having a strengthened legislative and institutional architecture yes that is a concern that's a blind spot that mm -hmm. uh, if we don't pay attention to then at the end of the day whatever legislation we affect will just go back to the same problems inefficiency lack of coordination and uh, wastage of resources you yeah. know Kenya Red Cross is actually recognized in law, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. What what piece of legislation is it? Kenya Red Cross Society Act. So Kenya Red Cross Society is a statutory uh, organ. Mm. Uh, it was established under an act of parliament adopted mm. in 1965, so the Kenya Red Cross Society Act. And so it gives us a very unique, by the way, status. Mm. One, we are a public entity established under law, but we are independent of government, and mm. that independence is not a myth. It is actually reflected or in the content of the of, of the of the act itself that we are independent of government. But we have a unique auxiliary relationship with the public authorities, meaning we work with both the national government and the county government to to you know as a secondary um, uh, uh, institution to support them complementary um, uh, to establish a complementary mechanism mm. to the government mechanism of disaster risk management so we have by law an obligation to have a strengthened disaster risk management architecture in yeah. the country yeah mm. are you funded in any way so no not for, for, not for a very long time uh, and so until uh, last year when uh, his excellency the president gave the directive to say as a public entity we are required to be given uh, funding because we are discharging a public mandate. Mm. Uh, the case was that no, we were not receiving funding uh, from the exchequer on an annual allocation. Yeah. So historically, we've received some money for particular responses to support government, mm. but it's only last year that we gave uh, we got a proper policy direction uh, to receive uh, uh, resources uh, from the exchequer on an annual basis. Mm. Okay. But, but. So the questions are many today in terms of what we're talking about. The rains have been, you know, intense for a couple of weeks now mm. uh, in certain parts. And then we've seen people already displaced. Uh, and the questions are then, I mean, so preparedness, what level of preparedness really um, has there been? And we're talking about right now, present situation. And then what would happen in the future? Because we're mm. seeing that these rains will go well into the month of May. Mm. So I'll speak about our preparedness and then just make a comment about the preparedness around the general humanitarian organizations and government. We understood from the word go we will be facing this scenario. So our planning architecture uh, and our response mechanism never stopped from the previous rain season, the El Nino, October, November, December rain period. So mm -hmm. we continued to put in place our measures, mechanism, various mechanisms. So we've repositioned all our supplies. Mm -hmm. As we speak, we are ready for a displacement of up to 20,000 households uh, mm -hmm. countrywide. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning our supplies, temporary shelter, uh, you know, material that is required by population displace up to 20,000 uh, households. We will be uh, comfortably dealing with that. Uh, so our staff are in place. Uh, we have activated our response, emergency response units all over the country who are ready for search and rescue, uh, support mechanisms, who are ready for, um, uh, you know, setting up of displacement camps and working with government uh, collaboratively on that we prepositioned our medical supplies uh, our 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 program protocol and response is active and in place and already being utilized i think the last uh, two weeks we've had a, been very busy on search and rescue uh, mission mm -hmm. so just trying to support communities that are either cut off from the the rest of population uh, people who are at risk of drowning and and saving them now in terms of the rest of the country uh, the 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 humanitarian coordination mechanism is also active so at the un level and other actors so we've been it has been 
in place to you know discuss how we're going to respond to these emergencies and allocate specific resources the same thing for the government uh, under the leadership of the deputy president who was chairing the committee on uh, responding to the flood so that mechanism is also active and in place now Eric, I, I think it is important that I make this comment, mm. irrespective of how much we are prepared uh, to respond to emergencies. What we have to understand is that the sheer volume of the waters that we are dealing with, it is difficult to control. So there is going to be uh, destruction, there is mm. going to be displacement of population that we can't avoid. Let me give you, for you to understand the, the uh, quantities of water we are dealing with. This week, Tana River, mm. the volume of water changed from 2.4 meters, mm. uh, which is an acceptable normal uh, levels of the river, mm. to above five in two days. Uh, That's double. Uh, yes, exactly. Mm. In two days, the volume, the total volume of the river wow. doubled within a period of two days. Mm. Because the highlands, uh, central Kenya, have received above 120 millimeter rainfall consistently for a period of about four days, five days. And, mm. and so we're dealing with a huge 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 amount of, of water mm. um, what will test us is when people are displaced uh, mm. and as they're getting displaced whether we will have sufficient level of support to make the displacement more comfortable yeah. Yeah. i think that is where the test of the uh, preparedness mechanisms are going to be in in place mm. and finally and i've made this comment consistently irrespective of how prepared we are as institutions if as the general public we end up you know having all these misadventures we end up having with waters the risks that we are taking people trying to cross uh, flooded uh, spaces, mm. uh, fast moving waters. Mm. Um, it just gives us a lot of work for, for, for no reason. Mm. So I think there's also an obligation to the general public. Uh, we already have enough on our plate as it is. Uh, so please let's be just more careful about what we do. Mm. Let's take a break. We'll continue this conversation shortly. 29 minutes after 9. Dr. Idris Ahmed is the Secretary General of the Kenya Red Cross Society. He's our guest telling us about the preparedness, the level of preparedness across, you know, all the humanitarian organizations and the coordination that they are receiving from government and then also creating that most important awareness on the people what to do in this time because it's going to flood. You don't know where, you don't know when. when. What should you do? We'll just continue that conversation shortly. Good morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. It's critical that people pay taxes, but then taxation has to have a limit. When you start overtaxing people beyond certain limit, then this is now we call robbery and violence. We are all struggling, but we don't show. If you're not doing well, shame on you. But you have to say, I'm broke and I'm struggling. <laughs> we are not okay until everybody is okay. okay. We are pretending to have political parties. Why don't we just be honest? And we say, these are the Luyas, these are the Kambas, these are the Kikuyus, and we are find ourselves in Kenya. You know, with, with politics and leadership, no matter what you do, mm. there will always be a complaint. <laughs> there will always be the assumption that you're either stealing or you're not doing things right. But as a leader, don't fear. If you know you're doing the right thing, you've thought about it, you've got an expert advice, do it, then understand later. This country, we don't need prayers. Prayers mm. is between you and God. Good governance and thinkers who care about the country and not their stomach. That's what we need. The Situation Room. Kenya's biggest conversation. Thank you very much, Eric, and it's good to be at the Situation Room. Always a pleasure coming here. This is the most challenging uh, interview panel in Kenya. You guys are very well informed, and as you can see, Charles, today, very philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> to be poor in this country is the greatest sin you can commit, not just from a legal perspective, but from life generally. Yeah. It, it, it is very, very skewed. We've just had uh, on the floor of parliament, just most recently, a leader within the ODM saying that Sisi Nimombe is a baba. Yeah. Which means that you're willing to be milked dry. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot force me to believe. I'll give way 
if it's a land that I'm told to return to you, I will, okay? Because the court has said so. But I'll continue saying, oh, what to many Russia. That's all that I'm doing. <laughs> the Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. The weather with Spice it's FM. Conditions in Nairobi this morning, chance of rain coming back at 20. We'll see highs of 27. 27 will also be the high and mostly cloudy in Nakuru at 21. 22 and sunny in Nyeri. And we're looking at um, um, sunny conditions at 19 in Eldoret, going to highs of 26. Mombasa is sunny at 30 and we'll see uh, cloudy conditions at 31 in Malindi. Out in Kisumu is partly sunny at 25 with highs of 29, while Kakamega at 24 is sunny through today with highs of 29. Kampala is sunny at 24 with highs of 29, and Dar es Salaam at 29 is sunny, going to highs of 32. All right, uh, looking into Johannesburg is sunny at 11 with highs of 20, while Mogadishu at 32 is sunny, going to highs of 34. Addis Ababa is sunny at 20 with highs of 26, and we're looking at cloudy conditions in Lagos at 28 with highs of 33. Kinshasa sunny at 25 with highs of 34, and we're looking into a sunny Beijing at 21, 11 degrees and cloudy in Paris, and mostly cloudy at 13 in London. It's 11 and cloudy in New York. Coming into Thursday, we'll see highs of 16. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. All right, so uh, traffic has not been uh, too much of a mess this morning. Let's take a look at what was coming off of Kiambu Road, which, you know, um, that has reduced significantly. Just a little bit of traffic at that Muthaiga Square area, even at survey on the Thicker Superhighway, that has disappeared. Um, also looking now, looking at Parklands coming out towards Limuru Road, we have some hold up there. And Landis Road, still pretty busy as you get towards Kamkunji at the roundabout. Ngong Road, traffic, you know, will ebb and flow for some time, but it's not going to be a hold up, at least not for now. Now. All right, Eastern Bypass then going coming in towards North Airport Road. That's okay, um, but there's just some traffic coming off of Cabanas towards North Airport Road out towards Outer Ring. Apart from that, we should be able to handle it. We're coming out of traffic hour. Talk to us through the morning and indeed through the day. Spice FM KE on X. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings are done right. The conversation continues responding to disasters and also preparing for disasters. That's a conversation we're having with the Secretary General of the Kenya Red Cross Society, Dr. Idris Ahmed. What's the coordination framework currently in place for disaster response? Is it on a case-by-case -case basis? For example, we have one which was set up in place for El Nino, mm -hmm. and then that has gone on into the rainy season. Um, maybe it was the same one that was addressing the drought situation. If we had another thing today, if we had a fire, huge fire, if we God forbid we had a terrorist attack again, uh, a major one. Is there one coordinating framework or are they established on a need basis? Yeah, so largely so far our experience has been very ad hoc. Mm. Uh, so we set up uh, some coordinating mechanism depending on the emergency. Uh, and and uh, you are right, so what was set up during the El Nino response is likely to continue for responding to these particular rains. Mm. Uh, but there's also other government structures that are in place uh, more permanently that are meant to help in coordination. So the National Disaster Operations Center is a center established under Ministry of Interior, mm. primarily obligated to coordinate uh, response to emergencies, especially quick onset emergencies. And so that's in place. Uh, the question will be the level of resourcing uh, uh, and the general uh, investment in the center itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, in terms of uh, slow onset emergencies like drought, we have the National uh, Drought Management Authority that is established also under an act of parliament, and it's supposed to provide an architecture for coordinating uh, preparedness and responding to drought as a, as a, as a particular uh, risk. Mm. Um, but the 
the conclusion generally is that as we said uh, a lot of room for improvement in terms of setting up a, a standing and coordination mechanism mm. for disaster risk management which is what we hope will be sorted out through this legislation that i had mentioned earlier mm. Mm. at present do you find um sometimes you find yourselves at kenya red cross working at cross purposes another humanitarian organization that responding to the same same disaster let's say for example the ongoing floods mm. tana river the rise in the waters of the tana river definitely that's gonna cause an issue yeah. downstream yeah. how many other humanitarian organizations are working in that region yeah are you coordinated are you co how well are you coordinated mm. yeah so uh, the humanitarian and this is globally speaking i'm not just talking about uh, the country mm. humanitarian work is a global industry it's 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 big business also yeah and so uh, the the level of interest that are there within that particular industry is huge and, and that makes it more prone to duplication, uh, more organizations, do, you know, working in the same area with uh, very little coordination in other areas. So undersupply in some areas and mm. oversupply of response in, in other areas. And this is, by the way, a global uh, problem. So mm. just to give you an example, as we speak right now, there are two major emergencies uh, globally. Sudan as an operation, mm. uh, the conflict in Sudan is a major humanitarian operation mm. the conflict in ukraine is another major one uh, just within the international red cross uh, appeals uh, uh, Ukraine is 220% funded. Uh, Sudan, on the other hand, is 9% funded. On the humanitarian level? Yes, exactly. Okay. It's 9% funded. So the, this is a global problem, this coordination, duplication, uh, working mm. across purpose and so on. So at the county level, we are meant to have a steering mechanism called the county steering group that coordinates which organization does what in a particular county. So mm. it's not as disorganized as it appears. But you uh, said we are meant to. Uh, yeah, sorry. You said we are meant to have yes, a steering yes, yes. committee. So, Does that mean uh, there is no, none? There are some counties where they can be strengthened in terms mm. of how frequently they meet, whether they are meeting the purpose of the steering groups, whether they are actually coordinating the NGOs in the area. Mm. But also meant to in the sense of many uh, humanitarian organization NGOs are also not willing to submit to that coordinated mm. mechanism. Mm. So it's also a problem on our side. Mm. for those of us who are operating in in these areas as humanitarian organizations so it's a question of whether they are doing their job to start with and whether we are allowing them to do their job uh, so we are thriving also on a bit of that confusion uh, that exists well it's almost as though you're taking a gun and you're pointing it to your head you don't know where the bullet is in the chamber yeah. and that you're hoping that every time you click it's not that time yeah and that's what we're doing with it this disaster every time because it's rain okay maybe it will not be 100 centimeters of rain mm -hmm. or 100 inches of rain whatever and that it'll dry up at some point and then we can go back to school and then maybe a, a few months i think it's like, again it's playing russian roulette with mm -hmm. a situation that can be sorted but the question is if proper preparedness was to take place like mm -hmm. you've mentioned mm -hmm. Would we, and we always need to draw the line, don't mm. we? Would we see, can we draw a line between proper preparedness and the reduction of the damage? No, not reduction in the displacement, for yes. example. Yes. Reduction in the, in the, you know, disruption of certain processes like schooling and, you know, care hospitals. Because if schools are flooded over, they, nobody's going to school. Yeah. Can we draw a line between the two? Because destruction, we cannot, we cannot, mm. we cannot solve that. Mm. But the repercussions of that destruction, can we reduce the severity of them by being prepared? Can yeah. we see that we can draw yeah. a line? Yeah. So, by the way, uh, the best strategy for responding, uh, you know, to planning for a disaster is prevention. Mm. Uh, so, you put in place mechanisms that prevent the damage as much as possible and the negative impact as much as possible. That is our obligation. That's the obligation we all have in that industry. Mm. It is not to prevent the hazard or the risk from materializing. Yeah. It is to reduce the impact of, on the general population.
population. Mm. So mm. if we have better coordinated mechanism for preparedness, that is what we achieve. We achieve, uh, you know, we achieve, you know, to reduce the negative impact of the disaster on the general population. So people will be displaced, but at least we have planned where they get displaced to, yeah. where we host them, exactly. where we provide uh, the, uh, you know, medical attention, how we continue providing uh, schooling. And but let me, let me just also afterwards. clarify uh, uh, this one. Mm. It will not be correct to assume that we will reach a stage where for every emergency, irrespective of how prepared we are, mm. that there will be no disruption on the lives of people. Okay. The idea of all oh. disasters is that it causes disruption. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, what we need to prevent uh, is where people's lives completely go to a, you know, a standstill, where no children go to school for months, uh, where no health care is provided uh, to population displaced. That is what we are targeting to, to prevent. And by the way, if, you know, Eric, uh, and, I, and I say this not because I'm trying to be put an optimistic outlook. Mm. As a country, we've really improved on how we do that. Uh, mm. We are not there yet, but we have improved. I remember there is a time when people displaced, there was no possibility of accessing education. Right now, whenever people are displaced, we're even having a discussion of what, how, how is, are the education services continued even in that context of, uh, of displacement. Yeah. So it is possible. It is possible. Thing. Oftentimes we can, we can have a conversation. Well, somebody should have done, should have done, and we say, yeah. okay, well, we can't because there's not adequate, you know, movement of resources. But what you're saying is that it actually can be done. It can be. pre-planned. You will know that there are schools in particular planes that will essentially be flooded over yeah. but we can move and we can say we can move to higher ground or we can move to you know um drier ground yeah. and the school or rather the education process can actually con yeah. continue yeah. Uh, because yeah. we're going to move people anyway we are by the way we're making very poor use of data and mm. so uh, the the issue is uh, now in part of my team uh, there's a team whose role is just to do that mm. uh, to look into historical data and give us prediction on what is likely to happen mm -hmm. and now with the application of science it is very much possible to know with this amount of rainfall this millimeter of rainfall in this place it is likely to flood in this area mm. that science is is there it is in place now the gap is once you've understood that science and we know you know if it rains um, 60 millimeters for four days in the narok area narok town is going to flood that yeah. much we know mm -hmm. uh, uh, it doesn't need a person from outside to come tell us what mm -hmm. is going to happen the question is now what do we do with that information mm -hmm. and there are three sets mm -hmm. of problems mm -hmm. one as a country and the general public, we are very pessimistic about early warning information. So, yeah, it's a cultural problem. Right now, we, we are, we've sent messages to, I'm sure, Eric, you must have received a text message from the Red Cross just telling you it's likely to rain in your area. And these text messages depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. We're having an excellent collaboration with Safaricom where we mark areas, we give them um, uh, uh, you know the areas that we want to send early warning information and depending on the telephone lines that are operating in that area will receive a specific message mm -hmm. this week we are asking uh, residents in Tana River who are closer to the river the low-lying areas move up uh, at least to higher grounds mm. and um, but the response is no, we will wait for the waters to come. Uh, and so we end up receiving calls uh, two days from today, come rescue us, we are marooned in this place. Yeah. We're stuck in this. So the first problem is that cultural thing on how do we react to early warning information. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that how do we allocate resources so that we can plan in advance. Mm. Our emergency financing mechanism waits for people to get displaced before we can allocate resources. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a global problem, again, from the donors to also the public resources that we utilize. Uh, crying wolf.
uh, does not get your resources to act in advance mm. and that's the second problem there's very little resources that are available for acting uh, in advance and the third one is that we are just not making use of science there is a huge gap between science and the practice mm. so you have people who are giving us early warning information and then the rest of us who are supposed to now put in place the practice mechanism uh, we are not doing as much as we should do so we need to find a solution for those three it's a public responsibility to understand how mm. to deal with risk to be responsive to early warning information it is our responsibility who have resources to locate resources especially the government for advanced preparedness um, so and it is uh, the obligation of those in practice and scientists to have more discussion and more often mm. Other things that you also respond to include security concerns, yeah. right? Yeah. And of course, we've been seeing Kenya Red Cross being roped in. Right now, there's an ongoing security operation, six counties, yeah. right, in the north. And Kenya Red Cross has been involved in whenever there's an attack, we hear what we're Red Cross, Olikuja, Besaidia, and this and the other. What's happening in that, on that front? So, and I remember the comment that I made earlier, uh, this uh, you know, these situations are interlinked, uh, yeah. and so uh, conflict reduces capacity of communities to, to deal with other emergencies, including yes. floods and drought, so it reduces the resilience. Floods reduces the resilience of communities to deal with drought, to deal with, uh, you know, conflict. The sad part is that as a country, it is these same communities that face uh, conflict, disease outbreak, uh, you know, floods, drought. Mm. The communities in the, in, the, in the north, the arid and semi-arid uh, areas and that's what makes it unfortunate mm -hmm. so in some areas then it creates a very complex uh, situation where because of insecurity it is difficult to even respond to emergencies such as floods yeah. it affects movement uh, uh, it affects uh, ability for, for 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 aid to be moved and so on so the first point is there's that interlinkage but yes as a as in a, as a country we are also responding to uh, the humanitarian situation that is resulting from insecurity. We have an active operation in Baringo, humanitarian operation in Baringo as we speak, uh, supporting uh, displaced uh, communities, communities mm. affected by the conflict and violence uh, in, that, in, that, in that area. Mm. In fact, we are the lead uh, agency from a humanitarian response in, in Baringo. Mm. The same situation for other parts of the country where there are incidences of insecurity. We also provide uh, emergency response, evacuation and, and so on. So we're primarily being kept really busy uh, in in the entire country yeah mm. what are we likely to see over the next you know couple of weeks yeah. um yeah we're in the middle of april now and we know that the rains are going to increase yeah. uh, in some parts mm. those are people being moved mm. more people be moved or um, and what are we hoping to see then also in terms of coordination in different parts? So the peak of the rainfall, by the way, is the end of April. Mm. So this month we are going to witness the highest uh, quantities or amounts of rainfall expected. Mm. And the next few days also will be very, very wet. Uh, the second related to it is we are likely to experience the, you know, the spilling of the dams, uh, the seven forks, the, the next couple of days. Mm. There was an early warning uh, information released by government. And once that happens, it means the volume of waters in Tana River is going to increase dramatically. So we're expecting huge displacement in Garissa, Tana River, the Tana River Basin as, mm. as a whole. Uh, so we are likely to have more people displaced in the next uh, couple of weeks. Our planning scenario is working with 30,000 households uh, displaced, which is a big population, and largely around Western Kenya, uh, in the Tana Basin, mm. uh, the Zoya Basin. Mm. We are also likely to see more uh, mudslides uh, in the central highlands uh, and these areas that traditionally have received uh, huge rainfall. So, mm. by the way, we're really concerned about the amount of rainfall generally in central Kenya. It's mm. huge. It's really, really, really uh, huge. So that's a second concern that we have. Of course, the secondary effects are also what we are concerned about. When it rains, uh, the road traffic crashes increases. Uh, and so we've mm. been witnessing the last couple of 
of days, many of these uh, accidents, uh, slippery conditions resulting on poor visibility and, and, and so on. So there are also the secondary smaller uh, and, uh, emergencies or d disasters, road traffic crashes, but cumulatively, by the way, that are resulting in huge numbers of people dying. Mm. Um, so uh, if we combine that with risk of waterborne diseases, then we will be... Yeah, it is a complex situation that we're anticipating towards the end of uh, this month. More displacement, more people affected, more waters, uh, more people who uh, are, are going to be in uh, displacement camps. What should happen to change people's attitudes towards receiving this information, early warnings, and taking action? It's not the first time. I remember even the last time West Pokot, was it the governor or was it the regional commissioner then Natembea saying, look, we gave people warning that mm. you are likely to see a mudslide and a landslide here. Mm. They refused to, to move. Listen. Somebody who is living right at the edge of a cliff and saying, we're not ah, moving. Nothing yeah. 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 How can we change people's attitudes? <laughs> that's, that's a good that's a good <laughs> one uh, that's a, a good task for behavioral scientists mm -hmm. to to take in place but there are compounding reasons why people don't take early warning information seriously mm -hmm. and one of which is that over a period of time we've never taken uh, the truth of early warning information seriously and once you doubt whether what we're even saying is true then people will not uh, respect that mm -hmm. uh, uh, you remember uh, some years ago, whenever the meteorologists speak, people will say ah, they are lying. They said it's going to rain and it didn't rain. Mm -hmm. So that attitude has been ingrained over a period of time. So yeah. I think the more people realize the science of forecasting has improved and the met is spot on in their forecasting, then I think over a period of time we will have more trust. They become more But believable. second, mm -hmm. we have to give people faith. Uh, that we are not just asking them to move, to get displaced, uh, but we are giving them options around uh, their movement. Yes. We are providing sufficient clarity on where they move to, uh, what kind of uh, situation they anticipate when they move, mm -hmm. uh, try to make it as comfortable as possible. Mm -hmm. We are not going to uh, you know, create a life that is as comfortable as your own homes, but at least you know that uh, you, you know, the suffering will be reduced of leaving your own homes. Mm -hmm. That's the, the second one. But the third one, I think we just, just generally have to change our risk uh, appetite as a country <laughs> uh, and, and so and this is cumulative uh, you see people rushing to uh, you know full tankers disasters. that have uh, yeah, over. fallen over and so on so we we seem to have a very high risk uh, appetite uh, and, and we're not taking safety seriously mm -hmm. uh, as a country and that I don't know what to do about it <laughs> I take the first two points that you've made yeah. And this is creating a trust framework. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So over time, if, for example, the Kenya Met would tell us it's going to rain at 3 p.m. and it rains at 3 p.m., then tomorrow if they tell you it's going to rain at from 4.15 p.m. tomorrow, you'll be prepared for it. Do you trust Kenya Met now, Eric? Uh, I don't even understand <laughs> their message. Uh, yeah. I've told the, the boss of Kenya Met here. Mm -hmm. Their message is, yeah, areas, highlands, high lowlands, west of low west probability. Valley is going to high probability yeah. of rain, increased South rainfall. It doesn't tell yeah. me anything, yeah. right? So I can see, yeah, yeah, uh, it's rainy season, uh -huh. it's going to rain, okay? Yeah. Ndu and I joke about, joke about the weather every day here mm -hmm. when we step outside. She tells me it's going to rain about 4.30 p.m. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. wherever you will be, it will be raining at 4.30 p.m., yeah. you see? Yeah. And that's the same attitude we have about yeah. Yeah. the authorities. The second thing is, of course, when you tell me there is a disaster coming, we want you to move, and you don't tell me where to, then I have no action to take. Mm. I have no information with which to take action. Move. To where? <laughs> So you've not told me that this area where you are is risky, but this area is less risky. Mm. You can then move here. Mm. And when you move there, you will find us ready for you. Then I will not act because you're telling me, Uku kwenu kutanyesha, move now, surely. Where do you want me to go? Yeah. From Kimana, Loitoktok, where do you, do you want me to go to Emali? Mm. Do you want me to cross over to Tanzania? Mm. What, what do, you want, do you want me to go to Taveta? Where do you want me to go? You know, you're not telling me. Yeah. Those two... If you can improve on those two, yeah. 
the other one of the risk appetite yeah really that will be our task i think mm. uh, the, we are investing a huge time as an organization to get that part right so right now by the way we've developed uh, a detailed protocol depending on different regions where the holding places will be mm. uh, and, and and as i think uh, we are committed as an institution to provide a solution for the second problem a clear framework uh, working with government in which we support people through displacement uh, yeah. processes just having ready shelter spaces uh, where we accommodate uh, you know when we talk about move to high grounds we've already predefined what those high grounds are yes. uh, so we have gotten this by the way right in uh, Budalangi mm. so Budalangi we've actually last year simulated a major exercise of full displacement of the entire population mm. and we just went through when we say move to higher ground what do we expect which are those schools you move to that will hold you which are those spaces what kind of work do you, do you expect and we hope to roll this back also in other parts of the country the Tana base in these areas that there is uh, general uh, displacement but there are huge lessons learned mm. when people know where they are moving to there are higher chances that they will That's listen the to early warning information yeah. yeah with all the information that's required i think that has been because it has been partial and so folks are not ready to make a a, a defining decision yeah. with partial information yeah you know because there are very many systems that are concurrently running mm. school for children where are we going to market where are we going for one two three if there's an emergency where will i go where's the nearest medical facility so if you're not telling people that we essentially are going to lift systems mm. with them the likelihood of them going is they'll rather say well let me take my chances with the flood yeah because at least i know here where i am and so maybe that should be a large component yeah. of even this response that information sharing has to be paramount because i mean look people have lived there all their lives and that's why you'll find somebody essentially re preferring to live on the side of a cliff that mm -hmm. might disappear tomorrow because they are sure at least they can see the house is there mm. <laughs> where you're asking them to go tomorrow they don't know in as much as it's for their health mm -hmm. and safety you, you haven't said wanting. where mm. you haven't said move out of your home go to xx primary school mm. and if you haven't said that then they actually don't have any information with which to act but Final message in about 30 uh, seconds. You've talked about these areas where we are likely to see um, serious displacement. What's your message to the people in those areas and even those who are listening who have relatives in those areas? Please, please uh, take early warning information a bit seriously. Uh, our staff, the, the, the general administration in those uh, areas have enough information on where people need to move to. I think we are going to, the next couple of days, increase the level of clarity around answering that question. When we say move to higher grounds, mm. what are those higher grounds mm. where we are likely to, to set up uh, camps? Mm. But let's just take the early warning information seriously. Mm. We don't have enough resources resources for search and rescue in the Tana Basin. Okay. I think it's a wide area. Mm. And if you are marooned, it is likely to take us a longer time to reach you. Mm. Uh, and I have to be very honest about this particular um, uh, one. Don't uh, take a risk hoping that if you end up being marooned, then people will come rescue you. We will do our best, but it is better we avoid that situation. Yep. So that's my first message. The second message is to the people in central Kenya and the highlands, Please pay a lot of attention to the groundwater and the stability of the ground. And, and so these are areas that are more prone to landslides. And this particular time, we are more concerned about landslides in these areas. Mm. So if you realize uh, this level of instability at that, that level of the, of the ground, please give the early warning information and move to safer places. Let's just be a bit more careful. Mm. But more importantly, our hotline uh, is open, 1199. Uh, if you want to pass any information around uh, impending risks, uh, call. We'll be happy to, to provide as much support as we can. Okay. 1199, that's the hotline for the Kenya Red Cross Society. Thank you very much to Dr. Idris Ahmed, the Secretary General, who's been our guest. Thank you for tuning in. Have a lovely day. It's a minute past 10. Uh, news time.